Kia ora everyone, welcome back from lunch. Um, I'm hoping the people at the hubs um, and at home on Zoom have had a good break and um, ready and for this last run to the conclusion of this fabulous forum. Look at all those people on the screens. Um, love to see your faces if you feel like sharing, but I can understand if you don't want to. Oh, there's a few coming. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> oh, there's Alex McMullen, look. Hey, wow, long time. Lots of people. Here they come, popping up. Wow. Yay. Oh, there's Peter Burton. I remember him from years ago. <laughs> Hello, Peter Burton. <laughs> wow. Fabulous. How fantastic. All right, well, I think we'll, we'll kick off. Um, I think before we start, Ken did a fabulous thing yesterday. I missed it because I had to go somewhere else, unfortunately. But um, he's going to do the same fabulous thing again. So, Ken, would you do your fabulous thing? Feel free to join us, please. Uh, tino, <clears throat> tino no tato, everyone. Um, yesterday we talked about restoring Modi um, of systems and, and whatnot, but um, also on an individual level. So, I um, invite all of you here today and online to copy me. This is a nice little micro break that we can do just to lift after a, um, our kai. Ah. 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 E, ah. A e i e a. A e i e a. A e i o i e a. A e i o u. O I E A. A E I was sure I saw it. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> a E I O U O I E A. A E I O U O I E A. last one. A E I O U O I E A. Wow, that was really good. I feel like I'm my 16 year old daughter when she was 16, which is a long time ago. It was fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we're going to move into our um, final theme of this meeting now. Um, Feeding the Māori. This theme is about how Māori can be enhanced through our food systems. And we're going to open um, with a panel discussion and we're going to close with a few speakers and, and then with the Associate Minister of Health later on in the afternoon if that comes off, which we haven't heard is not coming off. So that's the good, new, good news. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Christina Cleghorn and her panel and she will introduce herself and they will introduce themselves. And you've got people here and elsewhere? Cool. Okay. Do you need chairs? Um, you've got chairs. Cool. <laughs> Just have a seat. Kia ora koutou. Ko Christina Klekon Toku Ingoa. Um, so this panel, uh, we are going to be talking about kai and food systems. It consists of Dr. Christina McKercher, down here, Dr. Hemi Enright, and we've got Bruce Kidd. He will be popping up um, on the screen pretty soon. There he is. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. So um, this area, in the context of climate and health, is quite a big one and it's a little bit circular so we need um, healthy food to feed 
people so that they can be healthy, but we also need healthy whenua and climate in order to have those healthy food systems. Uh, the food system can be thought of as covering food production, transport, distribution, preparation, consumption, food waste. Uh, but to borrow from an amazing group of people that we were very fortunate to speak with in Tairawhiti, and they work on food systems in that area, it can also be thought of as a system ensuring everyone has access to affordable and nourishing food with local food systems that are regenerative and that protect natural resources. It determines uh, what, people, what food people have access to, their food security, their food, food sovereignty, what people eat, their health, well-being and the health of the planet. So I just wanted to really quickly introduce myself and why I'm part of this particular panel. <clears throat> so um, I've got a background in nutrition and I've been interested in sustainable nutrition for many years before I did my PhD which looked at the relationship between um, agrobiodiversity, dietary diversity and nutritional status in rural Tanzania. My current work focuses on looking at the likely health impacts, health system cost, equity and climate impacts of um, dietary interventions and policies if they were to be implemented in New Zealand. So actually I need my little clicker. I'll move this. I'd, yeah. So. Sorry to get rid of you, Bruce. Um, so this is just an illustration of how I look at these outcomes, and it is a representation of a multi-state life table model. So we have really rich data on New Zealanders, their health, what they eat, um, and then we apply dietary policy to that uh, really large data set. We change what people are eating based on what we expect to happen under a policy and then that gives us our outcomes. So we're looking at um, quality adjusted life years, um, the impact on health equity between Māori and non-Māori, and um, greenhouse gas emissions mainly. So that is a big part of my work. The other um, part of my work is leading a sustainable kai project that's funded by the um, Healthy Lives National Science Challenge. And I've been working on this with um, a great team of people. We've got Cleona Numertu, Andrew Reynolds, Nung Naim, and then our three panel members. Um, and we've been working on it for about three years. So we've, we've um, got a good chunk of the way through it. <laughs> um, part of the work that we did was looking at kind of an optimal, healthy, sustainable diet, where this diet met all the nutritional and um, food-based dietary guidelines. It came in under the New Zealand-based planetary boundary for greenhouse gas emissions. It wasn't any more expensive than the baseline diet. Um, and then we looked at what would happen if all of New Zealand adopted that diet. And that, possibly unsurprisingly, generated really large health gains because of the association between various dietary risk factors and disease and it also reduced the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the New Zealand diet. Um, and for those people who are interested in costs, it uh, generated $20 billion of cost savings to the health system over the next 110 years as people aged. Um, so that piece of work kind of asks the question, great, so that's a really great theoretical situation. How do we actually support New Zealanders to be able to make those choices, to choose those healthy, sustainable foods? And we've done some other work under this project. Andrew Reynolds did a systematic review, looking for examples internationally of um, policies that can help support people to consume these healthy, sustainable diets. Um, didn't find very many real world examples that had good quality evidence, but um, incorporating sustainability into dietary guidelines was probably the most popular and some financial incentives. And then the largest part of this project has been um, talking to various stakeholders about what sustainability is to them in terms of dietary intake and what could the government do to help support New Zealanders to make these healthy, sustainable food choices. 
So we talk to people generally from the community, from uh, Māori groups who have interest in the food space, to the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Primary Industries, Ministry for the Environment, some industry representatives, and some academics. Um, so you're going to be hearing a little bit about the results of this work from our panellists coming up, um, but I just wanted to kind of let you know where we're up to. At the moment, um, we're going to be, we are using the results from that consultation to model five examples of policies that have been deemed to be the most feasible and useful from that work, um, and I'll be modelling them through to those um, health outcomes that I mentioned earlier. So as we go through this panel, we've just got a few slides, they're just pictures, and um, they highlight work that's going on in the community. So um, some of the outcomes of our projects involve highlighting the projects that are actually already going on in New Zealand and try and amplify those voices. So I'm going to hand over to um, Dr. Christina McKercher, who's going to introduce herself and a little bit about what has brought her into this area. Tēnā tātou katoa, te atahi taku mihi ki te mana whinua o tēnei rohe Ngāti toa rangatira taranaki whānui ki te upoko tika Ngāti rau kawa tēnā huki koutou Tēnā tātou koutou e whakarongo mai nei mai i te ipurani He mokopuna hau no Ngāti Whrau me Ngāti Kaunene Ngāi Tūhoi E mihi kawa nga hau ki a koutou katoa. So I really came to this kaupapa because of my whakapapa, really. I'm lucky enough, my mum, my mum is a Māori dietitian. She's really old school, she's over 70, so she was actually one of the first ones trained. She was sent to Otago from Ōpōtiki. She didn't want to go to Otago, it was cold, and she was the only Māori person in her class. Um, and she married my dad, who is Pākehā from Southland. Uh, and so I actually grew up in Mirihiku, uh, but with a mum who was determined to make sure we understood our, our, our whakapapa from, from, you know, sort of my nana was... Te Puya Springs was where she was brought up and her marae are at Tokamaru Bay, Waipiro Bay, kia ora ken. Um, and then my grandfather, he grew up in a tiny little town called Uakituri. It's actually not a town, it's, it's like a marae. Um, and it, Uakituri is, is Upper Hawks Bay. It's got Tuhoi on one side, Kahununu on the other. And um, yeah, so he was inland. And my grandparents were, they, they pretty much thought all the time about kai, <laughs> I would say. And they both grew up knowing about kai. My grandfather knew about kai from the bush and he knew about gardening. He gardened by the maramataka, he had a huge garden. Um, and then my grandmother, she knew about kai moana, um, yeah, and she taught us that. And my whanau were into diving. In a, in, yeah, in a, in a big way. So, and my mum being a dietitian, she was really, when I was trying to make my mind up about what to do a long time ago in the 1990s, mum was working for a Māori Ho uh, provider, one of the first ones, and um, on a project that Hiki Pihima had started, Hiki Pihima is a Māori dietitian, and she'd started a, a program called. Um, Te Taro o Te Ora, and it was on Tairawhiti, and she was doing train the trainer of people on those marae uh, to, so that marae could, and, and the people could work towards more nutritious kai. And so my mum took that nationally and wrote the early things that Te Hotu Manawa Māori did. Um, and then I, I was trying to make my mind up about what to do. My dad's actually a GP, and so I was working as his receptionist, and honestly, slightly got a tiny bit scared 
<laughs> and mum was busy working with Kai, so it was just way more fun. So I, d I did nutrition like mum and ended up working um, in jobs similar to my mother. And yeah, and, and oh, when I was working for a Māori health provider, I was supported to do masters and uh, then I did a PhD and I got really interested in the food environments and the way in which the food that is available for our tamariki mokopuna and the policy levers that have created that environment. So I got quite interested in that kind of thing. Um, but I also worked for Otago and I worked for Otago in Christchurch. So I knew Otago and Wellington and we were, Christina and I were sort of introduced to each other by my PhD supervisor, Louise Signal. Um, it, because we share similar interests. So it's been really fun working with Christina on, on the sustainable kai kaupapa um, and learning about the wonderful work she does, modelling, because I don't understand it. Uh, but I do understand that in order to have modelling that works for Māori, you need Māori involvement. So kia ora. That, that's me. I'm just going to invite Hemi up to introduce himself as well. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko waio, ko Ngāpui, uh, ko Ngā Rua Hine Rato, ko Ngā Te Rua Nui, toko iwi, ko Hemi toko ingoa. Uh, kia ora koutou, since my face is on the big screen I might start with speaking to this um, picture. Um, so I was very fortunate to meet Kimi Ora Raireno, who's done um, extensive work in transport um, and mental health and marakai. And she took me to um, <clears throat> Papatua Nukumarae in Mangere, where I managed to get this candid snap of myself with a red tractor in the background. Um, so getting a picture of the mara that they have growing there um, and getting to see the work that they're doing. Um, and the sort of grassroots action that they're taking to recla reclaim um, their food and Kai sovereignty, um, which was very inspiring. And that sort of speaks to my journey into this space. So um, finished high school, didn't really know what I wanted to do, ended up doing medicine because um, my mum said that I should just do the hardest thing first. So I was like, okay, <laughs> um, finished that, still not really sure what I wanted to do. Did my house officer training up in Whangarei um, since we have connections to the north um, through Whakapapa and grew up in the north as well. And then did the first year of general practice training. Um, while I was doing that at Kaikoe, um, I could sort of see and feel that there were quite a lot of systemic issues in our health system that weren't meeting the needs of certain groups, in particular Māori. Um, so that kind of inspired me to apply for public health training and then as part of my public health registrar basic training um, I had to complete a master's dissertation so I had a few options. I had a project with Sue Kringle and um, a project with the Christinas and this one was very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this one was very interesting and um, I guess I sort of thought of my grandmother, who was a dietitian and used to work up at Ora Marae, and I guess this project just sort of allowed me to reconnect in some way with the work that she did a, gener a few generations ago. Um, so yeah, it's been quite an inspiring journey. We've travelled around, we've been to Gisborne before the floods and the cyclone, um, been to Kōkiri, um, been to Massey Uni here to talk to um, stakeholders and do focus groups um, and gather together people's different perspectives on the kai space in particular, um, the healthy kai and sustainability um, aspects um, and looking at how that intersects with policy. Um, I have yet to completely write up my master's dissertation. I have been putting it off a little bit. I apologise to my supervisors. <laughs> Um, but we have, yeah, we've walked alongside people, heard their stories, um, heard about the intersection and recorded people's whakaro in this space um, to create a body of work that speaks to how we can change the narrative of kai in this country from 
one of food insecurity where people, where the supermarket duopoly and other aspects of our current capitalist driven food system just don't, don't work for people, particularly if you're at the margins, but increasingly um, the middle classes and others who walk into the supermarket, see a block of cheese for sale for 20 bucks and think, am I still in New Zealand? We meant to make enough dairy products to feed 40 million people and this is my reality. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this project and what we've been able to achieve speaks to a changing narrative of food in this country and sort of shifting back to old ways and more simple fundamentals of growing your own food and working together as a community to provide food because the current systems are not working. Kia ora. Um, would we be able to get Bruce up on the screen? You should say Bruce is from London, I guess. Yes, so Bruce is in London at the moment and it is 3am or something ridiculous, so um, you're doing really well to be here. <laughs> I'll hand over. Kia ora. Okay, hopefully, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, so uh, tēnā koutou, uh, ko Bruce ke toko wingoa. Um, yeah, really excited to be here today and to be part of the panel um, to speak about the project. Um, so just to kind of, I guess, set the scene for what brought me to the project. So I'm, I'm Pakia of uh, British, Irish and Scottish heritage, um, and I grew up in Tamaki Makaurau in Auckland. And I remember always as a kid, my parents telling me about how I was always asking questions and was always really curious about the world. and how things how things were done and I kind of learned that through my parents because they always kind of encouraged me to think critically about the world and and I also had my aunties who who were nurses and they they really taught me about the importance of of being of service and um embedding those values in me so that really kind of steered me towards nutrition and public health um as there was a really strong alignment of those key values around um, addressing our, our ethical obligations to work towards health equity and climate justice. So yeah, I've been really fortunate to be involved in this field um, and to work alongside amazing people on the panel that we have and, and also other researchers um, and communities and experts on the ground as well. So I really was excited and amazed to join this project because it was really innovative in the way that it kind of incorporated um, community engagement at the core of developing policy. And so I guess just a little bit of a, a little bit of a snapshot in terms of what we've found so far. Um, so I've kind of been tasked with helping the project achieve its aims around um, engagement. Um, so supporting the rest of the team and Having, having those um, corded all with our stakeholders and developing some of those policies um, that they come up with um, to help address um, our food system for it to be more healthy and more sustainable. So you can kind of see as kind of um, the rest of the panelists have kind of talked about, it's, it's really been about amplifying what's already happening on the ground. And as you could kind of see in the pictures, of those community interventions. It's, it's really amazing to see what people are already doing. So what kind of involved me in the project was helping do those initial interviews and that were done by the rest of the rest of the team. And then we reviewed some of the available evidence of the policies that the stakeholders came up with. So were these policies evaluated for how effective they were? And do they have any data on them so we can model the impact of them later on, which Christina alluded to around modeling. And then what we did is we worked with our stakeholders to score the policies that did have evidence. And then we did another round of interviews on the top scored policies around how would this look like on the ground if, if these policies were rolled out? What are things that they need to know for implementation? And what are some things around potential barriers or unintended consequences? Um, 
And so what we did is we uh, mapped these policies that the stakeholders generated from the nourishing framework. So I guess very briefly, it's a framework that just outlines policies in three main areas. So these are food environment, uh, behavior change communication, and food systems. And just in terms of the results, what we found is that around half of the policies um, suggested by stakeholders were addressing the food system um, as a whole. So people were really thinking kind of bigger picture, which was really awesome to see. But one thing we found is that when we looked at the policies that stakeholders suggested, a very small minority of them had evidence. Um, so about 14, only 14 of over 100 um, unique policies uh, had available evidence for us to potentially model. Um, so that kind of, I guess, highlighted how there's quite a lot, of, quite a lot more work to do um, to kind of address the policies that we could potentially enact. And then so what we did later on is those 14 policies were then scored in a survey. And what we found is that the top ranked policies um, among our stakeholders were uh, healthy food and drink policies and school, school slash kura, uh, supporting community gardens, uh, garden to plate programs in schools slash kura, education about sustainable and healthy food, increasing incomes, and removing GST from core foods. So those were the top ranked, uh, top scored, sorry, policies. And as Christina mentioned, we're now putting some of these policies together after an, we've just finished another round of interviews and focus groups, and then we're gonna help to model them. So hopefully we'll come up with um, some exciting results to kind of capture this all together, but we do have a little bit of a snapshot from the work we've done so far. So that's all from me. Hello. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Bruce. Okay, we're going to move on to some questions um, that we have for the panel members. So I'm going to start with Christina. Um, we spoke to a lot of groups about sustainable kai. How did people feel about sustainable kai and sustainable diets? Yeah, sustainable diets or sustainable kai. Because <laughs> with the Māori groups, we ended up having to change our information sheet because people were triggered by the word diet. Uh, so, um, because, you know, in the normal, well, in the everyday context, diet, you know, I don't know, Aikens or, but no, we were talking about the food that people consume. So we, we changed it over to kai. Um, but we got, I'm really, really pleased we asked people, how do you define sustainable diet slash kai? Because I, I thought that it was a pretty, like I thought what was in my head was what would, have, you know, what <laughs> other people would say. But I was really astonished that there was a real range of opinions depending on the context of somebody you know where people came from and their backgrounds and and how they related to the issue so we got i mean one person came really really prepared and um read out the fao definition which is sustainable diets are those with low environmental impacts which contribute to food and nutrition security into healthy life for present and future generations. Sustainable diets are protective and respectful of biodiversity, ecosystems, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair, affordable, nutritionally adequate, safe and healthy, while optimizing um, natural and human resources. So that was one full on definition we got um, from somebody that had done their homework. <laughs> but what was also interesting as well that's an international definition what we also found out and christina knew this and i didn't but we don't actually have a definition for what we think is a sustainable diet in the new zealand context um which i i i thought was interesting because if you you know if policy is dealing with the problem of not having consumption of sustainable diets then it probably helps to define what what you mean um and then we got people going, well, do you mean economic sustainability or, envir yeah, or environmental? So I, I thought that was interesting as well. Um, 
And then we had people who were also triggered by the word sustainable. Um, we had one person who said, well, first of all, I don't want sustainable anything because it turns out that sustain that's sustaining the current system and that doesn't end well. And I hate that word. So, um, yeah. Well, I found, though, that when we, we talked to a range of different people uh, working for a whole lot of different places, but we also had community-based focus groups. And I found within the community-based focus groups with members of the public that actually the public had a pretty good idea. You know, people talked about plant-based, they talked about vegan, they talked about no waste, they talked about no packaging, they talked about local, local kai, and they talked about gardening. And then um, with our Māori focus groups, it was... Yeah, shall, I might bring in Hemi here, if that's okay, to talk about, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess key points of difference for the Māori focus groups were the incorporation of te ao Māori and cultural values, um, in particular the aspect of kaitiakitanga, um, which is being able to act in the role of kaitiaki or guardians of the Māori or the natural taonga resources. Um, and protecting and upholding them for future generations. So I think that's a key part of the sustainab sustainability discourse and creates a different sort of lens. So, yeah, as Christina was saying, it was quite interesting observing in the focus groups, um, particularly being um, a junior researcher with both insider and outsider status, um, to just observe the differences between framing things from a te ao Māori perspective versus a te ao Pākehā, and I guess that was reflected in language as well, like having these words like sustainability and um, diets come with so many other different connotations. Um, yeah. Great. Um, I've got a question for Bruce here. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, stakeholders in the project mentioned many policies. What have been some findings that surprised you based on the solutions they proposed? Yeah, I think I think one thing that's been um, really amazing to see from the project is, and I kind of alluded to it, was how people were kind of thinking big picture. So we had lots of people thinking of policies kind of um, at the food system level um, and also between like outside of food as well. So other other domains and other other factors and policies that influence food as well. Um, so I think that was really awesome to see because as we kind of all know, food is a really complex topic, especially when you start to go into food systems and you go into systems thinking and all that stuff. Um, so I think that was that was really great to see. Um, another Another kind of surprising aspect was when we looked at the policies that were scored by different stakeholder groups. So that was the survey that we did after the first round of interviews and focus groups. There were a little bit of differences between the stakeholder groups. So you found, so we generally found that the policies around that are kind of have the most research really. So your typical ones around food labeling, around uh, food taxes and subsidies um, and for reformulation, uh, they were generally ranked or scored um, much lower compared to other policies, um, except for mostly the academic groups, the academics that we had. Um, so there was quite a, a little bit of a difference there between um, those policies and, and how they are felt by um, different groups on the ground. So that was really interesting to see how the different stakeholder groups thought about different types of policies and and how much evidence there is um, for those that have support, really. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go back to Christina now. Um, what do people think might enable policies that would enhance the consumption of sustainable diets in New Zealand? And what did they think the barriers were? Well, not to be negative, but I'm going to start with what people thought were the barriers. And one of the major ones was, and I think it's interesting, this session is called, you know, Modi, about Modi, because the idea of food as a commodity, 
and being thought of only as a commodity. People, I not just Māori people, but Pākehā people working in that area identified that as a barrier, that you're, you've got something so vital to human life that you're just thinking of as a trading kind of thing. So that, yeah, that the framing of, of clay, um, and the fact that James sort of alluded at it to, to it this morning, um, the fact that there isn't really like, a strategy from the government that thinks about food as its whole. And someone pointed out that you have MPI dealing with food from a trade po point of view, you've got MB dealing with the business of food, you've got the Ministry of Health talking about food in relation to health, you've got the Ministry of Environment talking about food and the environment, and then you've got MSG talking about food and security. So you have all these different ministries and sometimes they're actually opposed to each other. Um, so that was the barrier. But in terms of the enabler, especially from community groups, um, it was kind of similar to what I heard yesterday. But I, I heard the feedback from yesterday was, uh, government, give us the money and please go away and let us get on with it. Um, was, yeah, that, that innate, like, enabling, there were some really, really cool solutions that they were doing in, in, in Gizzi. The just wonderful community, rangatahi-based um, fruit trees, and yeah, just beautiful solutions. And it was very much wanting to, uh, wanting the flexibility to, to work on those and the funding, sustainable funding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So letting communities work outside of government, yeah, that was I thought the enabler. Uh, we've got one for Hemi now. How does this project add to existing work in this space, particularly in a community setting? Yeah, um, I was just going to add to what Christina was saying yeah. as well. Um, some participants brought up the idea of like a Ministry of Food to sort of um, encapsulate and provide a bigger um, oversight in terms of food system planning and consumption and production. Um, and yeah, that sort of spoke to the siloed siloedness of current um, agencies and current activity on it and the need for a broader approach that wasn't just top down but also bottom up and worked with communities and alongside communities and I mean some of the stakeholders in the focus group spoke to how it was quite freeing for them to be able to sell their own produce when they could because then they could generate income that wasn't regulated and they didn't have to justify every dollar to a third party funder who was removed from their reality because um, that created a significant administrative workload and um, lots and lots of contractual requirements which were quite onerous on the community based team particularly when a lot of people are doing it out of aroha and using the aroha economy of giving the gift of their time and expertise and skills and receiving koha when possible um, but usually just doing it out of aroha and not for money. Um, yeah, so I guess in terms of how this project adds to work in a community setting, um, I think something that's been really helpful with the Masters in Public Health um, degree for me is the ability to do research methods papers and really work on my methodology and really um, work on that. and. Our project has really strong um, methods in quantitative and qualitative research and that provides a sort of framework for other groups to um, look to and perhaps use when they're doing their, um, preparing their proposals and applying for funding. Um, so yeah, something that I'm excited to keep working on is my methods and using reflexivity and just allowing that to um, create like a framework or hopefully provide some reciprocal learning to community groups where they can take some of these methodological ideas and apply them and implement them in their projects um, to help with funding discussions. Um, otherwise a key part of our work is in the community space is that we've gone out and we've talked with people and we've gathered their thoughts and knowledge and we're now turning that, translating that into 
um, a document which can help guide policy um, and advocate um, for these communities and raise awareness um, of the issues that people are facing and sort of work towards changing the wider narrative in, in society. And I mean, I guess for a lot of people, um, food insecurity sort of created the necessary conditions for people to shift from reliance on current um, food systems and look more towards creating their own. So this work kind of helps us and others to understand why there is a need for that and to hopefully generate more discussion on this. Cool. Okay, I've got another one for you, Bruce. Um, as part of the Sustainable Kai project, you've engaged extensively with stakeholders. How has this engagement shaped how you see yourself contributing alongside others to Sustainable Kai in Aotearoa? Yeah, I think, I think how I kind of see it is very much kind of, I guess, what we've been talked about, uh, talking about around amplifying what is already happening on the ground. Um, so yeah, we've been seeing lots of amazing um, projects and a lot of um, ideas that have been, that have been coming through the project. Um, so I think it's really about trying to connect those all up um, so we really have kind of a cohesive vision and, and a roadmap of where we want to where we want to be. Um, so I think it's just really um, acknowledging all those amazing participants that we've had on the project and and building those relationships um, with those people to ensure yeah we've got that roadmap because because as Christina was saying we 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 don't have a plan for food yet. There's no roadmap for us to get to where we need to be, um, and we have, we can create well, like we can create such an amazing food system that can provide healthy kai, sustainable kai. It can connect communities. It's such an opportunity, and we just need to get a plan and and do it and connect up these ideas. So that's kind of how I see myself um, contributing in this space. Okay, we've got one that's come through on Slido that is the most popular one so far, and it is for either Hemi or Christina, or both. Um, what kai policy would have the biggest impact on reducing Māori nutrition kai inequity? Um, I would say... A Oh, tricky, tricky question. Kia ora. Um, I don't know about saying re taking the GST off because I know I've, I've heard some debate around that. So I'm not allied to, I'm not tight to that, but in one way or another, uh, something around price of food and something around increasing incomes. Um, however you do that, I'm relaxed, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd have to agree with Christina about redistribution of wealth um, in some form or, or another. Um, I think another policy that really um, would help in this space would be looking more at marakai, um, which is more than just a community garden, it's a relational space um, where tangata whenua come together to enact kai sovereignty. So I think that speaks to resourcing as well because um, a lot of whanau are without whenua, so, and we're also building on our most rich, fertile whenua in South Auckland and the Waikato, which could produce all the crops that we need for the next 50 to 100 years, but that's another discussion. Um, so I guess kind of looking at how we could create access to whenua so that people can have kai sovereignty and live off the whenua again. Um, and I guess you can extend that out as well to include the moana because that's a rich food source and a rich um, part of the environment and needed for a, not, not a traditional 
kind of like a traditional decolonized diet, but also a contemporary diet that acknowledges that we're an archipelago of islands and we have to have a close relationship with the seas and be reliant on the Moana as well as the Fenua to optimize what we can eat that is healthy and sustainable. Great, so connected to that answer, but we can start with Christina. Um, food security or food sovereignty, sovereignty? Oh my God, I always struggle with that word. Uh, what is the difference and why does it matter? Yeah, um, going on the theme of definitions matter. Um, so again, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN say food security exists when all people at all times have physical economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And then they talk about the different components of food security, which are accessibility and availability and two others, which I've forgotten. But the trouble with that definition is that it doesn't actually speak to how how the kai is, um, whether or not the kai that somebody has access to has been delivered in a sustainable way, or whether, and, and so, um, you know, our government currently are fixing the problem of food insecurity for Māori by focusing on funding food banks, um, which is not in itself, you know, I'm, I'm not dissing food banks because I know some of the people who work in them, they're, they're, they're awesome, but it's kind of like a broken system. And um, so I think if you use a food sovereignty or a kai sovereignty definition, which I know Summer <laughs> is working on, um, you're, you're actually talking about how you've gotten that, you know, how, how you've gotten that kai, that kind of thing, whether or not you've had your mata, um, been involved in that, yeah. Yeah, and I think the, difference to me is kind of maybe the emotional feelings, like the emotional, um, psychological experience of gathering your, your kai and consuming your kai. So at the moment I feel like people are scared to go to the supermarkets because of how expensive everything is and how that's going to impact their budget for everything else. And to be able to enact kai sovereignty I don't think people should be scared of gathering the food that they need to eat to remain well to prevent the development of type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, so that they become even more reliant on a healthcare system that's struggling to cope. Um, so I think, I think it is trying to create a shift in this country from food insecurity to food sovereignty where people can practice control and power over their food and the relationships with their food in day-to-day -day contexts that are acceptable to them. Actually, hold on to the microphone. I've got another question for you. Okay. Um, can you discuss any risks you see in the Kai sovereignty space? For example, with the recent weather events, Whenua was reshaped and reclaimed by nature. How might this impact Māori? Are there further risks to Māori Kai sovereignty? Yeah, I think it's definitely a nervous space. Um, most of the um, Māori treaty settlements um, process where fisheries and things like that have been returned, they're all quite climate reliant um, crops and quite vulnerable to ocean acidification, um, which is an emerging issue of increased co carbon dioxide concentrations in our moana. Um, I think with also like following colonization, like the Māori land that remains, what, what is left is usually quite remote and sometimes can be quite difficult to access. Um, and the storms have proven that our networks of roads are quite vulnerable um, to slips and um, other forms of destruction. Um, but I think something that we need to be mindful of is resilience and I mean I was having a discussion with Ken about this a few months ago and that Māori are used to, we're used to surviving and adapting and overcoming challenges and making making the best of what we can and if the whenua by the sea is reclaimed by the sea then you know looking to the nahere and what we can do in the forests instead or looking to the and what we can do there or 
instead of having traditional marakai, which involves quite a large amount of square metres, looking at vertical, um, vertical gardens that are stacked on top of each other, which was one of the key things that came out of one of our focus groups at Kōkere Marae. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of potential for creative solutions in the space that enable continued kai sovereignty and construct kai resilience in this space. Kia ora. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we've got um, a question that's come through Slido that I think, Bruce, you'd be best placed to answer. Uh, regarding removing GST from core foods, what would you consider a core food? Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is the big question, isn't it? Um, we've, so we've had discussions with stakeholders around this um, after the policy was, the policy idea came about and, and there was, there was quite a difference, different, different amounts of opinion. So there were some who were kind of saying we should use the core food definition that Australia is currently using. So that's very much um, around fruits and vegetables, um, nuts and legumes, um, fish, seafood, uh, meat, dairy, kind of your core basic kind of food groups, which are very similar to, I guess, the dietary guidelines. Um, and then there are others who are also saying, well, actually, as a core food, as a core food, this needs to be sustainable as well. So maybe we need to think about other food groups that shouldn't be in that list, such as um, fish and meat and, and seafood as well and, and dairy. Um, so I think that's that's a key question that we're kind of um, looking further into um, a bit more. So I think hopefully we'll come come across um, with some results to kind of see what would the impacts be on on from the modeling data on health and environment um, for those different scenarios in terms of how you define a core food. Um, so whether we follow Australia's guidance or whether we focus a bit more on incorporating um, environmental sustainability. So I think that's a big question. Okay, we, <clears throat> I think we've just got time for just a couple more questions. So um, Hemi, how does this work relate with policy yes. and how can policymakers help? I guess we've framed the project to be quite palatable to um, policymakers, um, like with using their language like GST and healthy food policy in schools. Um, so I think it kind of speaks to their existing language, but I would hope that it challenges people um, reading the report and the outcomes of the project to sort of rethink their view on food and um, realise that it is that it is a major contributor to poorer health outcomes and um, also global sustainability. And I think that's personally speaking from like a primary care general practice perspective, that's sort of missing from a lot of discussions. Like we've got acknowledged um, epidemic of, syndemic of climate change and obesity, um, but we're kind of not really acknowledging the public health context that our patients exist, when, exist in and acknowledging the obesogenic environment and just calling it out for what it is. And I think that could be a really helpful part of discussions. I mean, I was tutoring the medical students yesterday and we were talking about motivational interviewing and I was sort of looking through the five A's of obesity about ask, assess, and I was sort of thinking, mm, might, would it be more helpful instead of having a motivational interview to actually be talking to someone about the power structures and getting them to be critical about where their food's coming from so they can sort of reinterpret and reimagine how they interact with the food environment and sort of realizing that they're being manipulated and then sort of pushing back against that instead of having a motivational interview where we talk to them about what works for them. You know, like just sort of really broadening that discourse and shifting away from individual action to people seeing stuff for what it is and being able to call it out and realizing how it's contributing and just taking away those feelings of blame and realizing that we're all kind of victims of what this capitalist food environment has created. I feel like I've just gone off on a major tangent there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and 
And I guess something else that really spoke to me from the focus groups is going back to Kai sovereignty is sort of like the joy of food. So like one of our participants was talking about how um, she is growing food from her whenua where she has tanga to whenua and she just loves being able to eat from the whenua that she's connected to through tupuna and ancestors and just talking about like the joy of finding like a red radish and like sharing that joy with um, tamariki and mokopona and just like the inherent joy that could be present within collecting and consuming food that I feel is kind of missing from a lot of people because people are scared of going to the supermarket and scared of how much the bill is going to cost at the end. Um, and just remembering that interview that uh, Hemi is talking about, I also remember that particular participant who's kind of like a Māori food sovereignty kind of champion, talking about rungo and talking about the peace from, from Marakai, which I feel embarrassed about talking because I know Ken, Ken has worked in that. But she also talked about, you know, the decolonial project is sometimes feels so huge, but you know, her mata was one thing she could do. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's a, a great kind of point to end on. So I think we'll wrap it up there. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to the panel members. Thank you, you two in person, and thank you for staying up, Bruce, and contributing from afar. Kia ora. Well, that was an extraordinary session, wasn't it? I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? The potential that's there to um, really transform things. And, you know, the work that you guys are doing um, is outstanding. And it's kind of odd, isn't it, that, you know, here we have, um, you talk about an optimal, healthy, sustainable diet within the planetary boundaries for the country that has these health benefits that are clear and um, huge carbon reduction and saves $20 billion in health savings over the out years that, you know, you'd have to ask yourself, why is this not happening? And, you know, do we need to sort of persuade to help people make choices? And it comes back to a bit, Hemi, of what you were saying, that actually there's something going on here. Maybe it's a conspiracy. <laughs> Maybe it's a conspiracy. I think it might be. Um, but I think that um, if people want to find out more about the work, because um, it's, and I'm going to, <laughs> um, we can email, um, there's a contact on the website uh, just for the conference organisers, so it's rsvp.events at otago.ac.nz. And I think that goes for all of the speakers and all of the things that we've heard over the last couple of days. But if there are um, questions and you want to find out a bit more about any of the topics that have been raised, um, I think that's a good sort of single portal of entry and those inquiries can then be distributed out to the people um, who can um, respond appropriately. Uh, I hope it's okay to direct emails to that, um, looking up, yes, I think there's a bit of a shrug of the shoulder, but yes, probably, yes, okay, all right. And, um, okay, so I think we'd better move on, um, but thank you very much. Uh, better find my place. Um, is it 2.30? Yeah, it's afternoon tea. Gee, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's only 15 minutes, it's a quickie, uh, and then it's just, um, and then we've got two speakers and the Minister, uh, the Associate Minister of Health afterwards, so um, enjoy afternoon tea, and um, if you want to grab people's emails at afternoon tea, do that too. Okay, thanks so much. Hey, um, we're going to get going now. Um, just to let you know that there's, um, there's a lot of food out there. Um, there's lots of delicious food that, we've, um, that you can actually take home later if you feel inclined. So there'll be trays of food um, 
they'll be set out in individual trays. So if you feel inclined to take uh, a little snack home for um, later on, for your neighbours or your children or your brothers, sisters or parents um, or friends, possibly even for your pets, um, there will be some there. Um, we're just. Um, this is really the last session of this two-day forum now, and we're um, continuing on our theme of feeding the Māori. Um, and we're going to hear from um, three speakers. Um, the, f the first two speakers are recorded, in fact, um, but both of them are available for questions because they're in, um, I think both of them are in the Auckland Hub. Our first speaker is Nikki Hare, and many of you might know Nikki or know of her. She's spoken at our forum, one of our forums, previously. Um, she's a professor at the University of Auckland specialising in community psychology and the psychology of sustainability. Her research addresses issues of sustainability, citizenship, values and political activism. Um, she's an author and an editor. In 2007 she co-edited the book Carbon Neutral by 2020, How New Zealanders Can Tackle Climate Change. The two most recent books are Psychology for a Better World, Strategies to Inspire Sustainability, and The Infinite Game, How to Live Well Together. Nikki gives lots of talks and workshops to community and government organizations about how to inspire action for a more sustainable future. She is a coordinator of a three-course module on sustainability for arts and science students, and is currently the head of the School of Psychology uh, at the University of Auckland. This, uh, the presentation's recorded, but she's available for questions at the end of it, so um, let's go. Thank you, Nikki. It is lovely to be invited to talk to you about climate anxiety and thoughts on how to navigate it. So I want to start by talking about what emotions are. And psychologists sometimes use this three-part definition to consider an emotion. First of all, it is a feeling. Something is happening in our body. Second, it is an image. Thoughts and visions are going through our minds. And finally, it is an action tendency. So different emotions have the tendency to make us want to do different things. Now, if we look at this picture here, which is people in a positive state, we can see maybe a dad and his daughter, their bodies are uplifted but relaxed, they've got smiles on their faces. We can imagine they're feeling good in a general sense. And the images going through their minds, perhaps of that park they're in, the sea in the corner, the seagulls, each other. What do they want to do? Well, it looks to me very much like they want to play. They want to get out there and explore. Now, if you think about negative emotions, which is unfortunately, if you like, the focus for today, they, instead of broadening us and making us look outward and want to be creative and take risks and all of that kind of thing, tend to focus us in on an issue. So we have a desire to solve the problem, and if we can, we tackle the problem quickly and directly. So here's somebody who realises that they haven't studied for their maths test, their mind is full of the anxiety about this being about to occur, they want to pass the test, so what do they do? They sit down and study. Great response. However, with chronic problems that can't be solved quickly and directly, we may figure out that the thing to do is to get rid of the emotion itself rather than the problem. Climate change not easily dispensed of the way a maths test can be. So then we can move into this mode of denial. And if we think about uh, climate change, two of the big emotions, all of which feed in ultimately to climate anxiety, are fear and anger. If we consider that human beings have a flight or fight response to threat, fear is the flight, anger is the fight. So let's look at these two a little bit more. So fear, again, if you can respond really quickly and directly is great for prompting positive health and safety behaviours. Dodgy spot on your arm, feel fear, go to the doctor, get some kind of um, diagnosis, you've done the right thing. Again, more difficult with climate related issues because you can't just take swift action that will deal with the problem. Still, fear has some value. Now, Remembering it's a withdrawal, 
and we saw Sam there in the Game of Thrones hiding from White Walkers behind a rock. Thinking of these pictures, which induces the most fear in you? And when you've had a moment to consider that, think about why you chose that picture. Now for me, personally, I choose the storm surge. Why? Because the house I live in is seven metres above sea level, and the idea of big seas and sea level rise is really personally threatening to me. And does it make me want to go out there and fight for climate change? No. It, it inspired me to take the swiftest and directest act, the most direct action I can, which is to imagine selling the house and move into higher ground. So fear, in this sense, for me at least, is a withdrawal that ends up potentially being pretty selfish. Of course, what happens in reality is a sort of moment passes and my fear you know, recedes and we continue to live in the house seven metres above sea level. So let's talk about anger now. Well, anger is the fight response. So it's it's the sense that other people have done something wrong and your task is to correct them in some way. Daenerys Targaryen is about to set the city behind her on fire with their dragons, but less extreme reactions, but still pretty powerful, is someone like Greta Thunberg. You can see there in her bodily response as a leaning forward, classic angry pose her mind is full of images of all those people that are doing the wrong thing and what she wants to do is tell them to get their act together now anger is of course a big part of social movements including climate change um, research shows how important it is for motivating collective action the downside to anger is that it's based on us them divisions and it can fuel violent cycles of attack and revenge. Anger destroys, which sometimes we need, but it doesn't build up, which is a pretty important um, part of tackling climate change. So thinking about anger finding that way, which image induces the most anger for you? My answer would be the bottom one, because I can imagine the companies responsible for that pollution that's coming out of the pipeways and the fact that somebody has to walk over that um, to pass between their home and their work or to get food or whatever that person is doing, it just seems wrong. So it's that self-righteous kind of response that we can get um, with anger. So just to summarise those two, Fear, withdrawal, self-protection, paralysis, anger, tearing down, and demanding action on others. Now, sadness is the third one I want to talk about a little bit. And sadness, at least the way I'm talking about it here, is a more diffuse, um, less, less acute reaction than anger or fear, and in a sense, less blaming. It's aligned with things like worry. Something really bad has happened, and I wish it hadn't, um, but it's not necessarily about something that someone did wrong or something that I can solve. Now, interestingly, sadness has been associated with increased contribution to environmental causes. And I've wondered if that's because it has less of that people-based focus that often sort of distracts us um, sometimes from getting involved in, in actions ourselves and building up, if you like, the good society. So which image induces the most sadness for you? For me, that would be the polar bear. It's only one left out of my choices. Um, and, and part of what's interesting about the polar bear, of course, is just the sort of eco-grief that many of us feel about damaging this beautiful planet and the, if you like, innocent creatures within it but also being able to see the polar bear's face and that empathic reaction that human beings have to, to the faces of others. Um, even a polar bear who, if I think about it uh, in an analytical way, isn't really looking like anything, but I find it pretty easy to project uh, you know, a, a, a fear and distress onto the, um, onto the bear myself. I want to talk now really specifically about eco-anxiety, which is in many ways a bringing together of um, sadness, fear and anger 
into this chronic state of um, discomfort about uh, climate change and what it might bring. So the American Psychological Association has defined it as a chronic fear of an environmental anxiety, and it's often discussed as a kind of pre-traumatic stress. So we're in an interesting situation where um, it's difficult to know what particular events can be attributed to, and so for many of us it still feels in the future. Having said that, I think those who live in um, the North Island um, here in Aotearoa might be changing a little bit on that, the feeling of you know, the cyclones and the heavy rains, um, the damage to properties and communities and so on, is making it start to feel um, like it's very much with us. And of course, many people have suffered a direct um, trauma through loss as a result of those kinds of events. But still, the human being has an imagination, and even if something bad hasn't happened to us yet, is that, but it will, sense. I want to talk a little bit about a study by Hickman and others in 2021 that looked at uh, 10,000 young people from 10 different continents, 1,000 people in each country, so one country in each continent. Australia was there, not us. From age 16 to 25 years, and talked to ask them about their um, about their attitudes and, and feelings around climate change. So this graph shows you um, the, the impact on function. So below is how much their feelings about climate change negatively impacted their daily lives. And you can see the list there, eating, concentrating work, school, sleeping, spending time in nature, playing, having fun, and relationships. That's those sort of mode bars. And then these bars underneath are how worried they are. So the red and orange are people that are worried, extremely and moderately, uh, Moderate, uh, extremely or very yellow is moderately um, through to not worried. And you can see pretty high levels of worry overall. But I do want to draw attention to two countries in particular, Finland, where we see relatively less extreme worry, and the Philippines, where we see a great deal um, of extreme worry. And if we look at those two countries in particular on this graph, which has um, a whole lot of emotions listed, we can see in the Philippines sort of 64% feeling hopeless, feeling uh, versus 54% in Finland, um, above that 91% sad versus 54 about 90% afraid versus 54%, 70% angry versus 49%. And that's just drawing attention to some of those those emotions and getting us to think about sort of what's different between those two countries. They're not detracting from the fact that the numbers are high overall. And just one other table. This is um, you know, thoughts or images and responses in the future. So humanity is doomed at 73% in the Philippines, 43 in Finland. The future is frightening, 92 in the Philippines versus 55% in Finland, and my family security will be threatened, and 77% in the Philippines versus about 30% in Finland. And, you know, to give some context to this, I'm sure you've all come up with pretty plausible theories already about the differences between these two countries. One um, feature is there's something called the disaster risk index, um, which is the world report, and according to the 2021 uh, world risk index, which included 181 countries, Finland was by number 171, so a very low risk, whereas we can see here that the Philippines is number eight, so of very high risk, I know I should top the list. And this risk is a combination of the likelihood of these disastrous events, you know, um, storms and uh, volcanoes and earthquakes and all sorts of other natural disasters, but also of the infrastructure and support mechanisms within the country in order to respond to those events of really wealth, as well as a particularly natural configuration for the country. And the Philippines is, is um, you know, quite vulnerable in both those regards. So. You know, it's on the sea level rise, extreme weather, rising temperatures, rainfall, 
a number of natural hazards are likely, and it's dependent on climate sensitive resources with a lot of coastline along which people live. So you can see that for young people in the Philippines, the um, future already has, uh, these events already have occurred, and it's really sort of clear um, their vulnerability and um, that their family security might be threatened. Now, this one uh, actually is not so much featured on, you know, doesn't show those differences in the two countries. But this is the sense to which people feel a sense of betrayal by their governments versus a sense of reassurance with the um, salmon bars being betrayal and being higher in all countries. Brazil here um, seems to have a somewhat um, worse profile in this regard than, um, than, than any other country. And the last, the last uh, of these, these figures I want to show you is the correlation between negative thoughts about environment, the environment, um, and feeling betrayed by their government. Uh, sorry, about climate change and feeling betrayed by their government. And that's a pretty high correlation at 27. And what it indicates, without being able to say causal direction, is that that, that betrayal, that sense that you are not being looked after and distress, are, are pretty highly related. We'll get back to that. So, uh, as I said, a lot of this, some of this distress is based on real world events. Um, it's particular to certain places, but a lot of it is also um, generated by by the narratives that we find in um, the media and public conversation. So just to give you a quick um, snippet here, this is an article about giant plumes of Saharan dust that um, choked a whole swath of the southern United States as being a generational event, um, which deepening climate change, induced droughts, and all sorts of other hyperbolic language to um, describe what is happening, designed really to um, generate generate the sense of apocalypse, um, accompanied by rather apocalyptic looking pictures such as this. So this kind of language um, is not uncommon. And there are accompanying this many, many headlines where a view book saying that um, politicians are useless, so don't rely on them to fix climate change, whether they're the UN um, or, or local politicians, um, such as those responsible for Auckland's climate uh, systems. So all of this is what I've called an apocalyptic double play, uh, an insistence that the planet is going to rack and ruin politicians are useless and it's exacerbated by an expected twist in these liberal individualist um, sort of democratic societies in which people are supposed to take charge of their own um, of their own well-being is uh, that you, you need to do something about it so it's it's uh, not okay to not be um, sort of deeply distressed it's the kind of plug I think that it's going on um, at some cost to, to our well-being. So it's a perfect storm for eco uh, climate anxiety, high levels of worry, low sense of trust in others or feeling that they can be heard. One of the um, elements of that betrayal item that I talked about before by government was whether the government listened to the concerns of young people and a sense that this is somehow your problem. Without the sense that you court should do something about it it's it's really more like fatalism than it looks like in the side so how do we never navigate this well this is my finish and i've got three suggestions the first is um perhaps a bit of fatalism at one level not quite but to accept that anxiety comes with the territory uh we we can't and in a sense we shouldn't limit that human beings who care and live in a social context wherein some of them at least are going to feel some anxiety. It's a, a pretty normal response to the conditions we're facing. And what's more, some level of anxiety leads to support for climate policies, um, primes us for action. And remember how I talked about negative emotions, focusing attention on the issue which floods our minds. If you're anxious about climate change and it's flooding your mind, yeah, the att your attention has been drawn, and to some extent, that is a good thing. 
The other one I think um, I'm really interested in is this idea of um, try not to project your fear onto others. Fear, I, fear, I think, has some limited value. I'm also not really sure about anger, although it's probably just me not <laughs> enjoying it very much in myself or others. Uh, but you know, fear, that withdrawal, is, is, it's pretty difficult to see a strong place for. And I want to read you a little bit from an um, essay written by Tony Kushner in a, that is called Despair is Alive. We tell ourselves, and it's in a book called The Impossible Will Take a Little While. And Kushner starts this little essay by, by writing, a Chicago cab driver recently told me, if there's a supernova 60 light years away from here, the world will be totally wiped out. We don't stand a chance. He gave me something to think about, namely the fact that life, each individual life, and our collective life on the planet is not infinite. It has an ending, so the future you've put your faith in is not, in fact, limitless. Given the catastrophic failure to seriously address global warming, given the sagging of the world's economy and the refusal to see any solutions beyond making poor people suffer even more than they always do in the hopes of reviving a market that only ever revives long enough to make the rich even richer. Well, it's sort of optimistic to believe it's a supernova that's going to get us. It's clear that what's much more likely to get us if we're got is our present way of living in the world. And he goes on. Since I was a little kid, I've been told I have choices, the right to make a choice. Although I've never been dumb enough to believe this was literally true, I've also been, never been dumb enough to be literal. And I've always believed I could choose to believe or not believe that the arc of the moral universe is long, that it bends towards justice. And he talks, goes on to talk about some of the actions we've been taking. He ends the essay like this. So when the supernova comes to get us, we don't want to be disappointed in ourselves. We should hope to be able to say proudly to the supernova, that angel of death, hello supernova, we have been expecting you. We know all about you. So we've been expecting you, everyone, everywhere. And we would like to say supernova in the moment before we are returned by your protein fire to our previous state, clouds of incandescent atomic vapour. We'd like to declare that we have tried our best and worked hard, make a good and just and free and peaceful world, a world that is better for us having been here, at least we believe in. So you can take an ex a lesson from that, I think. Is despair an obligation or is it, as Krishna suggests, a choice or even a lie we tell ourselves. I'm very, I think it's very important for adults, especially with young children, to think about um, what they what they want to project. And a lot of that is about how how you hold your own emotions. So the third, the third one I want to talk about um, just for a couple of minutes is to be intentional. Um, one of the things about social change, one of the things about disputing and working, uh, if you like, against the status quo, is that it's more difficult than you can describe, because it's not just a practical difficulty of, of getting things in place, it's that the status quo draws us in like a black hole. The status quo is belonging, it's status, it's comfort, it's also how family it's super hard to resist doing what everyone is doing. And it carries this emotional cost. It carries often a sense of um, disloyalty, a sense of disorientation, missing out on the brownie points, um, the, the need for multiple reality checks with like-minded others and so on. So how do you be intentional? Or just um, segueing off what I just said about like-minded others, I won't advocate that you think about sustainability networks as a solution for that. And at the organisational level, I've actually um, been involved in helping set up three such networks. And they're networks in which the intention is around creating a sustainability culture that is oriented towards flourishing planet, planet 
and thriving people. So that's a sort of really broad mission. And then you work together to do projects that are trying to support them. And you cry on each other's shoulders and support your, uh, report your occasional wins as well. The one I've been involved in um, was at Western Springs College in Mapuna Opairao, where for 11 years I was actively involved in a, um, a network that's still going on there as a, a research and a parent, along with um, school students, school staff, and external supporters like the Auckland Council. And we did a number of projects around uh, waste management, but art projects, introducing subjects, um, stream cleanups, fashion, fashion shows using trash, um, many, many projects were generated by that. The second example is a network here at the University of Auckland in the Faculty of Science, which was focused around sustainability. Uh, we got an, a working group, they were all volunteers, but as it happened from all the um, schools in the faculty, we did uh, recycling, we did composting, and we had a sustainable labs project where the labs and the different schools would do audits of their processes, and we also had seminar series and, and many things besides. And finally, just to finish, we are doing something at Starship Children's Hospital with um, James and Sadie, Stephanie, me, and just most recently, Alicia, where we hope to set up a similar network with that, that broad sort of mission of moving towards a culture of sustainability and generating and supporting each other on projects as we go. So be intentional and do it with others. Thank you for listening. Uh, kia ora, Nikki. Um, it's David Gallagher here. Look, thank you very much for that talk. Um, it's lovely to have you um, uh, come to this forum again, um, and what you have to say is so relevant and so important. Um, we haven't got a lot of time, so maybe we can just slip in one question that I'm going to take from Slido. Um, and uh, I think it's you've, you've answered some of the questions around how would you, what advice would you give to people about um, about talking about their concerns or feelings around climate change. And I think that possibly you've addressed that through the issue around um, peers, uh, networks, collaborations. Um, would there be anything else that you'd want to offer by way of advice there, Nikki? It's just that matter of being careful about um, the emotional valence versus the content of what you say and thinking about um, Expression yourself with strong emotions has a strong impact on others and being careful, just taking care of those who are listening to you, as well as uh, being able to say your own truths. And look, one other quick one, um, given that anxiety is so ubiquitous, um, how, e how easy is it to attribute it to a single cause? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, anxious people might pick something to hook their anxiety onto as opposed to um, this causing it. It's, I don't think it is possible to distinguish that, but I also don't think anxiety is an irrational response to the kind of narratives we're getting about what's happening to the planet. Um, and to some extent, it's irrelevant if you if somebody talks about these events in an anxious way, there's ways of you helping to manage your own emotions and making communications that inspire hope and the possibility that we can work together as opposed to sort of exacerbating that anxiety. Thank you, Nikki. Listen, there are a number of other questions here, but, but we're a bit short. Uh, yes. Is it possible if, if we were to email those to you um, uh, with a, you know, the, the, would you be able to have a crack at answering them for us? Yeah. Yeah, and I'd also just like to do a quick shout out to Molly, who I think is there and has been super involved in this Starship project as well. So um, hi, Molly and Alicia and Steve, I think are there as well. Good. All right. Hey, thank and you, Nikki. That's fabulous. And, and hang around if you can. And Neve's there. Thanks, Neve. Yes. Cool. Thank All right. well, you. Thank you so much, Nikki. All right. Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't get through all of those questions, but I'll, I'm, I'm, Victoria, Debbie, we can perhaps send them through. We'll, we'll see what we can do. 
Okay. Um, now, um, our next speaker is also appearing through video link, but is, I think, in the Auckland Hub um, to answer questions too. And uh, that's Associate Professor Dan, Dan Hikuroa. Uh, Dan is uh, Nati Maniapoto, Waikato Tainui, Nati Fanonga. Uh, he's a father, he's a surfer, he's a paddleboarder, a gardener. He loves the tail and is Associate Professor in Māori Studies um, at Waipapa Taumatarao, uh, the University of Auckland, and an established world expert on weaving indigenous knowledge and science to realise the dreams of the communities he works with. He's a, a UNESCO New Zealand Commissioner for Culture and his key roles within the New Zealand Centres for Research Excellence, the National Science Challenges, and advises national and regional governments, communities, and philanthropic trusts. He's spearheading alternative ways of assessing sustainability, including in weaving indigenous knowledge and epistemologies with science, and from there into legislation, assessment frameworks, and decision support tools. So, um, Welcome to you, Dan. Thank you very much for um, recording this video for us and hopefully some questions at the end of your corridor. So thank you. Advancing Planetary Health. So just thanking uh, and acknowledging those who have spoken before me and acknowledging the organizer of this conference. Uh, I'm honored to be invited to speak at this kaupapa and I'll do my best to maybe build on some of the things you've already covered so far in this hui, um, and then perhaps even expand some of your understandings. Having a look at the program, I could see that Modi has featured heavily already, and in fact, we will we will cover off aspects of Modi as well uh, in my corridor. And um, first, actually, I want to start with, with the title, uh, Toi Tu Te Marae Atane, Toi Tu Te Marae O Tangaroa, Toi Tu Te Iwi. Uh, and this is a, a whakatauki, miki, whakatauki, perhaps, you know, a proverb of saying, uh, meaning that if, if the land and the sea are well, then the people will be well also. And so that's a very, very Māori uh, way of seeing the world. It's a very, very Indigenous way of seeing the world. And, and that framing comes from both, both a Mātauranga Māori base, and we'll explore that just a little bit, uh, as well as that Māori worldview. And then I'll go into some practical understandings of what, what it might mean uh, for this planetary health with respect to, to Modi and Matauranga. So, Matauranga Māori. I'm sure many of you here will be very familiar with what it is, uh, and some of you may be slightly less so, but just a real brief uh, overview. Uh, Matauranga Māori, in inclusive of Māori knowledge, but also uh, our culture, our values, and underpinned by, by a Māori worldview. And of course, the Māori worldview sees us as being a part of nature, not apart from nature. I think that's one of those, those fundamental understandings that's quite critical for us to start exploring when it comes to understanding um, tai ao, tangata and whole water and, and this planetary health framing. And so, mātauranga, many forms we know of uh, with our oral tradition uh, are things like pūrāko, uh, pūkōrero, our waiata, uh, our, our oriori. Our, our whaikōrero, those, those oral forms of knowledge that, that are ever so rich uh, and, and extremely accurate and precise and, and, and tested through time. This is also, I, I hope, another example for you of, of what Mātauranga Māori can look like in the more tangible form in, in, in the shape of this whare. This is Umutahi Marae um, and Umutahi Whare of, of Umutahi Marae in, in Matata. Now, I need to be clear, I don't whakapapa to this place, but I, I have permission of the Marae Committee to use this image uh, for, for education and, and corridor purposes. And so, of course, the knowledge here is, is in the shape of the design. Um, this is an absolutely classic, you know, whare design. You'll find it throughout, throughout Ngamotu. Uh, and then the other materials that we use uh, to construct our, our whare nui, our whare whakairo, our whare moi. Uh, 
although they can vary in between different uh, iwi and hapu, particularly in the regions where you have different trees, uh, but each of the trees selected would have specific purposes in mind, whether it be for the exterior cladding or whether it be for kind of the stress um, bearing elements of, of the potoko manawa, the, the central pole, and maybe the tahuhu, the, the central backbone um, in the whare. That's all knowledge around which trees to select and, and which are the appropriate ones. Of course, we have other materials that they're in, the tukutuku panels, the, uh, maybe the kia kia that's used um, for those with the raupo. And then we have the knowledge that sits behind um, the ochres that would have traditionally been used. These, of course, being uh, the colours of Papa Tuanuku, our earth mother, the reds, the blacks and the whites. And there is knowledge that comes from either where you collect those in that form. Uh, say, for example, the, the the, the, the black can come from, from anoxic environments such as swamps or in estuaries. Uh, and the white might come from um, things like uh, altered uh, rhyolite rocks or orange geothermal areas. Nevertheless, the, the key point I'm making here is that Maturanga exists in the tangible form as, as well as the oral form. And then there's maybe one more layer of, of Maturanga that I'll talk about here, which is actually of particularly particular relevance uh, for today. Uh, both in the contemporary setting and also I think for this conference, uh, for the conference in TNT setting is, is actually where you build your marae and the knowledge that sits behind um, information of where to build, but maybe more importantly, where not to build. And as we're seeing this year with extreme um, weather events, and floods, superimposed with sea level rise, uh, it's, it's, it's of real importance that, that, um, that, our, that our infrastructure, if we want to use that term, or, or, or our marae, our whare and built places that uh, we know or we know to be safe based on our previous knowledge. Now, I need to make one caveat here in that uh, our state of knowing comes from what we've seen and experienced. If, as we move forward, we start to see more extreme events, such as the like we've never seen before, uh, then that might be with a mātauranga, uh, might be found wanting, but in general, uh, so far, we appear to be holding up fairly well. So the key thing about, about all knowledge, in fact, is that it's underpinned by a worldview. In Fano, we all have one. Every single one of us, you here today, in fact, all of us will have a worldview. What we regard to be real, possible, and impossible. And the key thing is that uh, there is a dominant worldview in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, and, and it's become so dominant, I suppose, that it becomes almost invisible. And it's only people who have different worldviews to, to that dominant one that are, that are kind of seen because it's not part of the mainstream one. And I need to be clear, I'm not making any value judgments on, on, on people's worldviews or what they are. I'm merely pointing out that we have worldviews and the person next to you will have a worldview. And it might be very similar, it might be exactly the same, or it might be a little bit different, or it might be wildly different. The key thing is that uh, it's important for us to keep in mind when we're looking at and trying to make sense of or trying to come to understanding of things or trying to implement uh, programs or, or, or ideas and understand values, uh, our worldview is our underpinning aspect of that. What does that actually look like, though? Remember this time? You know, finally, we have a bit of a chuckle about that now. So, oh, gosh, you know, how, how silly. But, you know, for a time, this was real. This was what was believed, um, and it was only until such time as um, that the earth was circumnavigated that this was proven to be wrong. And so with, with new information and new knowledge uh, come new realities. I had an example um, about where my worldview was, was, was really quite strong. And if you've ever had a situation where you found yourself saying, oh, I just I couldn't believe my eyes. Probably it's not that your eyes are broken, it's just that what you're seeing doesn't align with uh, what your worldview accepts to be to be real. And so here's, here's my example. I was I was leading a field trip down in a national park, and I had a group of students visiting from overseas, and we were talking about kaitiakitanga, matanga Māori, and it was part of an earth and environmental science program. And we'd been there for a few days, and the weather had been a bit inclement. And finally, I said, oh, look, the skies have cleared, finally. Maybe we'll go outside and we'll, we'll, and we'll look at the night sky. And what I want you to look for is things that are similar uh, and things that are different um, and things that are new. I said, oh, and keep an eye out for, for satellites as well. Oh, well, then what, how do we know what a satellite looks like? Oh, it's just like a star, but, you know, just just track slowly across across the night sky. Okay. 
and a few of the eager ones rushed outside. And uh, I was picking up a conversation with some of the other students who were um, still picking up on, on, on the mato dunga. And then as we're walking out, I reflected upon this later. It wasn't really a conscious thing, but I, I heard a few of the students you know, saying, hey, there's Orion's Bell, but it's upside down, and there's this, and oh, my gosh, what's that one? Is that the Southern Cross? And then someone exclaimed, hey, there's a satellite, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And look, I remember I had one ear listening on this corridor with the students on, on, on the, on the Matauranga, and, and I was also thinking with my other ear, oh, my goodness. I said, Goodness knows what they're seeing, you know. In all my years of looking at satellites, I've only ever seen maybe three or four at once in the night sky. You know, but I got out there and, and this is what I saw. And, and far no, I could not believe my eyes. Now, to be clear, it wasn't that my eyes were broken. Far from it. It's just that what my eyes were seeing didn't equate with what, at that time, I believed to be real or even possible. Now, yes, 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 of course, a quick Google search and we discover this was SpaceX, it was Elon Musk and his, his chains of satellites are going to revolutionise the world. The, the point being is that uh, for myself and in fact many of the students, who some of them were quite freaked out, that what we saw didn't equate with what we believed to be real and, and some of the students really began to, to, to think about some really crazy kind of scenarios. And so that's the power of our worldview. It's strong enough to act at a subconscious level to tell us that our eyes are broken. And I think that's something really powerful and helpful for us to bear in mind as we start to think about what kinds of knowledges and ways of knowing and being and doing might we look to tap into as we seek uh, the aspirations of, of what all of us here for, for this for this quarter and this conference are about. And so that brings to, to be this idea of knowledges. The idea that there's more than one way of knowing something. And even though we might be looking at this, we might be relating to it, making sense of it different. So if we were here in person, you know, I would I'd get up interactive. I'd say, hey, so what have we got here? So I've, I've done this before. So I'll tell you what some of the questions are. Usually it's a really weird look. It's like, well, clearly it's a whale. Of course it is. But, you know, there's some whale enthusiasts and they know they're whales. And they say, this is a, a humpback whale. Oh, boy. And this is a scientific name. It's a it's a large winged New Englander, Megaptera novangliae, named after large pectoral fin and been sighted off the coast of, of New England. Despite the fact that its whale, of course, is, was found, you know, around the world. Um, but for others, you know, this this whale is is an ancestor. Uh, and, and for and for some groups, you know, there's a particular name for this whale, the humpback whale, and for them it is Pikea. And so the key thing there is that the question isn't who's right and who's wrong. The question is, how do we learn from both of those ways of knowing and being and relating to this thing in order that we might seek better ways of doing and understanding, particularly as we come to understand the impacts that humans are having upon the tile and how it's manifesting in the whole order of, of people. So here's another example of worldview. Hopefully, if all the pedagogy of, of teaching is correct, here's what you might have just experienced, and hopefully it is, because we can't get interactive. Um, because our eyes and brains are really good at recognising patterns, hopefully your eyes would have recognised this as a pattern of New Zealand, um, but that it's flipped upside down, and then your cognition might have jumped in, and you probably thought, oh, ka aroha, there's been some formatting issue here. Dear me, his image is up the wrong way. And then your eyes would have actually picked up, that, oh, no, there's words there, and the words are up the right way and then maybe you started honing in on a particular word that appears quite a lot in this image and that's the word Maui. So this is an alignment of, of um, Aotearoa New Zealand consistent with the Maui Puraco. Talk about how he fishes up uh, uh, the North Island of New Zealand and then how his waka became the South Island. And because Te Upoko o te Ika, the head of the fish is in Wellington, conceptually Māori view New Zealand um, this way up, with the head uh, aligned to the to the up, and then the tail to to the down. And I actually remember as a child, my uncle was saying, "Oh, you know, we're going to go, we're going to go up to Wellington this weekend." You go, "Oh, we're going to go down to Whangarei, um from from the context of of Auckland." I actually thought they were having me on. I thought they were teasing me, you know, and it wasn't until years later that I actually realised that actually no, they were just that was living the perspective of of 
Aotearoa in alignment with the Māori worldview, with, with a Māori worldview. There, there are more than one. So the key thing there is that it's still unmistakably New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand. It's just a way of relating to it uh, as if it's so slightly different, you know, drawn from that Mātauranga base. And so the key thing about, about Mātauranga um, and about Māori ways of knowing and being and doing uh, is, is so strongly um, bound in whakapapa. And, and whakapapa is both in a human sense, a, a genealogy, but it also explains the world and how the world was created. And because everything we see in the taiao uh, and up in, up in the rangi, up in, up in the sky, uh, comes from the primal parents, rangi nui and papa toanaku, everything is interconnected and everything is interrelated in a kinship-based way. And so that is a very, very... Um, widespread Māori worldview that we are linked from this world. In fact, many of the stories say that we are the last born. Uh, and so we are, therefore, everything else is our elder. And, and in the culture of Māori, you, you revere and look after your elders. And so in that framing, you know, there's these ideas of kaitiakitanga spring forth. Now, kaitiakitanga being uh, a sense of responsibility for your kin. Uh, and a sense of responsibility for, for your elders. And so whilst within that, we have uh, user privileges of resources of, of you know, te marae o tangaro, of te marae o tāne, uh, we never had ownership rights of those things. We had user privileges, but with those came those responsibilities. And one of the key aspects in which we understand um, the health and well-being of 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 timarai or tane of timarai or tangaroa of of whole of people is is in modi now i know you've heard a little bit about modi already i'm just going to spend a, a couple of slides talking about maybe adding to your understandings so uh here is here's an image of the tarawera river in, in the headwaters and, and i'm hoping and this is based on previous um presentations where i've showed this this, this image and I just ask, how's the Modi of this river? People usually say it looks pretty good. The water's pretty clear. And then you've got native vegetation coming all the way down. There's a little bit of algae in the water, and a little bit of algae is is, is good Modi. It shows that it's healthy. Um, and so there's a consensus that, yeah, the Modi of this is pretty good. And you go down on a short 65 kilometer journey. And this is this is the Tarawera River where it flows out you know, in, into the um Te Moana Nui Atoi, the Bay of Plenty. And, and well, when I ask people the same question, they say, oh, no, the Modi of that river isn't as, as, isn't as good as it was. In fact, it might be pretty poor. Now, you know, we could use the instruments of science to do all sorts of measurements to, to tell us what the difference is. Um, but, and whilst that would be helpful and useful, they would only be confirming what we intuitively sensed was that the Modi of that river was not as good as it was further up. And, and therefore, that shows the simplicity uh, and therefore the elegance of a concept like Modi. And we can actually relate that a little bit to human health because the reason that is paru is because there's a whole lot of activity going on, including um, from, a, from a pulp and paper mill that used to operate up in, up in Kawiro. And so this idea of, of, of Modi is also linked to human health. And if we just take a moment to think about Human health, and I'm very, very, very simplifying it here. Uh, the concepts of tapu and noa, uh, whereby you know everyone has a small has tapu, um, varying amounts of tapu. Um, sometimes the chiefs had a bit more, but but the tapu was at a level that it was safe to operate normally, and so that's at a noa level. Uh, when we became unwell, um, our tapu was elevated. And so that then sometimes if it was um, we were unwell enough, we were removed from everyone else in order to maintain um, the Modi so that, that basically so the sickness didn't spread. So you, you, your Modi becomes impacted, you become unwell, your tapu is raised, and so then you're taken away in, in a form of kind of like a rahui. And so we can, we can think about rahui in the environmental context too, and I'll come to that one in just a moment. But the point I want to make here is um, when the pulp and paper mill was operating, uh, all the scientific evidence of the day says, yeah, yeah, those chemicals are okay. Those chemicals are safe. Those chemicals are fine. Um, and so even though 
people who worked in those mills, and in fact, I, although I don't have relatives who worked in this one, I had relatives who worked in, in the, um, the Kinleith mill, a similar mill using similar processes over near Tokoroa. Um, they would tell me about, you know, really severe headaches and, and crawling and itching of the skin when they came in contact with, with these chemicals. And so um, in a Modi framing, their Modi was really poor from exposure to these chemicals. And even though now I believe there might be epidemiological evidence which links um, those chemicals with the intergenerational cancers we're seeing with such high prevalence in Kawero uh, and in Tokoroa and from those, those former sawmill workers, the key point is that um, Modi would have been an accurate framing for the health and well-being of those people um, that's now 35, 40 years too late. So even though we have that really hard, precise information now in the form of epidemiological evidence, a Modi framing would have been accurate at that time and then proven to be just as precise you know, as, as we move through time. So there's one framing of Modi that starts to link it between the, the health of the environment and the health of people. Now, here's another thing that occurred most recently, and this is in the environment. You know, we had uh, the MV Rena ran aground on Otaiti on, on the Astrolab Reef, uh, and, and it spilled a whole lot of oil. And, you know, the impact was immediate in the environment. And so the health and well-being of the tire of these birds uh, was, was, was severely impacted. Now, folks, if you felt anything when you saw this image, you know, we have we have a word for that that you felt the modi you felt the impact of the modi of those birds and hence to the to the environment and that can actually you know can manifest in ways in the health um, and well-being or, or the or the, the unhealth of, of of people and so hopefully i've expanded some of those ideas of modi for you and and what actually happened there was there was a determination that um, part of the the ship would be left on 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 the reef but that when you start to see images like this, that actually the modi of that place bounced back really highly. Now, all the ecotoxic materials were moved, um, the copper, the heavy metals, the, the heavy fuel oil, that was all removed and just pretty much steel was left. And although that's not pristine, we can see that it's not really impacting the, the marine environment too much in this place. Um, we did try and get a rahui for this, and that would have been amazing. But sadly, um, you know, some of the some of the decision making didn't quite keep up with some of this thinking, which was so manifest, you know, because uh, it was a no go zone for some time while they while they removed as much of the wreck, and the modi was restored. It didn't quite happen there, but it gave us some learnings, and we try to apply that elsewhere. And so one of those is um, in the form of rahui. So in the environment, when the modi of an area becomes um, severely impacted, uh, the tapu gets raised and we can use an idea like, like rahui, a temporary restriction um, on, on activities in that space designed uh, to let the modi recover. So remember, it's the modi that's the trigger. The modi gets impacted, the tapu gets raised, you, you put a rahui in there with the intent of allowing the tire to recover. And then when the tire has recovered, the modi, um, the, the top modi recovers, the tapu drops back down to a nor level. There's no longer the requirement for the rahui. And so this is some of the framing, and this is some of the work actually, this uh, I, I highlight here, uh, a big endeavor project, which is underway. Of, of, I need to be clear, I'm a part of this project as well where um, different uh, haukainga groups have, have placed rahui with the express intent of, of you know, picking the modi of or picking the modi or, or te moana, you know, really lifting the, the modi of the moana. And in fact, even just in, in the ability for us to do that is actually uh, picking up the modi of, of the people because they have a sense of, of agency and purpose in this space. And so I started with, with this image and I said I would come back to it. And so here we are, Fano. One of the visions um, and so part of the visionary work of Ngāti Whātua Rāke is to try and restore the Māori to Te Whenua Rangatira, um, restore the Māori to Okahu. And so Te Whenua Rangatira are the lands that they've had returned to them. Um, and of course, for those of you who are unaware, off screen, um, gosh, as I look at it, to, to, the, to that side of the screen and up on the hill is Takaparafo, uh, Bastion Point. And then, so they have a plan to restore the land, restore the Māori to the land, collecting seeds, uh, locally derived seeds from local bush and recloaking Papatuanuku. Similarly, they have a plan to restore the Modi to the bay. 
Uh, and you can see this the vision that came out of out of some 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 community placemaking work there. You know, so that thriving marine ecosystems provide sustainable climate resource. So we can actually go in and use techniques of science to understand, um, you know, are there climate species there? Um, are there enough? Are they getting big enough to be harvested? Are the populations uh, able to be sustained? Some harvesting. Uh, are those uh, mahinga kai species? And down here, it's it's mainly uh, tuangi and pipi, although there are some mussels. We're doing some mussel work further out. You know, are they actually healthy uh, to be kai moana? And so these are the kind of questions uh, that link with, you know, toitu te morai o tane. Once we have recloaked Papa Tuanuku back up on the land, toitu te morai o tangaro. Once we have enabled uh, these populations of kai moana to replenish uh, the seagrasses to come back and perform their functions and we've got mussels further off now we're starting to see um, the dolphins and the orca are coming back into the bay so there's a sense that the, the modi is beginning to restore and and then in time once all those have been um once all those restorative measures in the land and in the sea and the seabed have taken place then that will manifest uh, in the life sorry in the life and the health and well-being of of the people so far no hopefully that's given you just a little bit more of an insight into some maori framings of of the aspirations of this conference and, and, and the dream of which i strongly adhere with and support you know taia tangata haora advancing planetary health if we can draw from those indigenous ways of knowing and being and doing i think we'll be in a much better place and so just to to close on two things you know one of the most amazing learnings of i've had on my time is actually this this idea of be a good ancestor and that means living up to those all all those responsibilities of a good kaitiaki and also the final one is that if we recognize that uh, indigenous ways of knowing and being doing are uh, going to contribute so well to advancing planetary health it's a good reminder for us all that we're all indigenous uh, to this planet no reira uh, kia ora mai tata katoa and i look forward to any pātai kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Dan. Um, David Galler here. How very nice to see you, and thank you for that really sensational talk. Um, you know, uh, we haven't got huge amounts of time, but there are um, a few good questions here, uh, a couple of good ones. Uh, and um, I'm going to start with this one. Um, if, we are a if we are planning or adapting for one in 1,000 year events, and we saw some illustration of that in a previous talk about some work going on uh, seawall protections in, in Europe in particular you know if we're planning for one in 1000 year events how will Matorang Maori knowledge help about the safe areas for us to live um, and uh, how we might you know be much more productive in that in making those choices yeah kia ora David um I'll draw um, and expand on the example I gave in the talk where it will probably inform us where the places where it's not very safe. Uh, and those will be places where um, where Purako of Tanifa are manifest. And so what the modeling tells us is that as, as we have greater um, storm frequency, greater storm magnitude in particular, coupled with sea level rise, those areas where um, those unique combinations of what we already have with spring tides and with with um, with hazardous conditions are where Tanifa reside. And Tanifa are amazing because they're both the evidence and the policy to keep us safe. And so they're not going to tell us so much um, where, where the safest places are, but they will give us a really good guide on where some of the most unsafe places are. So if by process of elimination, it's going to assist us there, um, I, I think that's where, where Mātauranga can really um, provide amazing information and for those kind of decisions. Cool. Thank you, Dan. And one final question. Um, um, so often people require a scientific affirmation of what we intuitively know, as you've pointed out, and um, it's kind of akin, you know, I, I sort of recall, you know, the cases that, you know, you hear about of, you know, people or pay children being sent home from an emergency department with what with flu-like symptoms and a mother, for example, saying to that emergency department staff, saying to the staff there that this is not the flu. 
you know, this is, my child has never had anything like this before. But, you know, the science points to, the, the scientific model points to the fact that it looks like the flu, and the child goes home and has meningococcal disease and you know, sort of dies. And, you know, so just a little, a, 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 an observation around the scientific method and, 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 you know, this sort of kind of deeper knowledge that people have. Yeah, and look, and that, that example hits really close to me. I had a, um, a classmate who passed away during my undergrad with um, meningitis that went undiagnosed despite three trips to the ER. So I think the point there is that science is never about certainty. Science is about trying to reduce uncertainty. And look, and I don't want to point any fingers at our, at our health professionals in this country who are doing just the most amazing job under really trying circumstances we can't always get it right. But to go back to the example, I think of where Modi can inform us, I think uh, Modi has been shown um, to be accurate through time. And so in that regards, I think if, if enough of us can say, hey, actually, gosh, um, if enough of us had said, enough of my, my uncles and, 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 and grandparents and, and their friends had said back in Kinleith and, and back in Kawero, back in those the 60s and the 70s, we actually don't feel very well. And although the, the, the well, there was no real evidence, let's to be clear, but the, the way they felt was genuine. And in a Modi framing, it was about trusting the framing. Um, that they, If they could have had some more waiting for that, maybe some more, what we can learn from that then is maybe a more precautionary approach might occur. And, and here's hoping, and, and back to the example you gave and the one with, with my classmate, and I remember her name, Natasha, um, is that we, we can only be as good as we can be, but we always need to try and be the best we can. Cool, Dan. Look, thank you very much for um, taking the effort to contribute today and for um, being around and answering questions, and I hope you can stay on for the yeah. last little bit of this. So thanks so much. All right. Okay. Kia ora, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, look... Um, Thank you. Um, I want to welcome Tiana uh, Jakasevich uh, to, to the floor here. Tiana, thank you very much for coming today. I'm just going to try and give you a brief introduction, if that's okay. Um, you know, you're a descendant of Ngāti Kununu, uh, Kitawairoa, uh, Te Whakatohia, and uh, you've got Croatian heritage, I understand. And um, Tiana hails from the east coast of Aotearoa, uh, grew up surrounded by the forest and the oceans of your ancestors. You hold an intrinsic understanding that the solutions to the climate crisis are tied to the decolonization and restoration of indigenous knowledge systems and relationships with people and place. Uh, Tiana is passionate about the restoration of whakapapa for the regeneration of Papa Tuanuku and is actively involved in various environmental and climate just justice kopapa, both locally in Aotearoa and internationally within UN mechanisms and indigenous peoples from around the world. So, uh, Tiana, we're very grateful for you uh, making the time to speak to us today. So, the floor is yours. Do I have to click that? Maybe. Oh, that way. Uh, to a tahi ake, uh, ite fare o te ringa waka, uh, e mihi ana, tuarua, e mihi o uh, te atiawa taranaki whānui Ngāti Toa. Um, uh, tua Toru, uh, Ngā Wai O. Ngā Wai O is different from Ko Wai O in that Ngā Wai O is whose waters are you of. So Ko uh, Te Wairo Hōpū Hō Ngene Ngene Mā Tangirau Te Awa, Ko Whakapūna Ke Te Maunga, Ko uh, uh, ngai te apatū, ngai, ngā, ngā te moiwhare, uh, ngā hapū, ko takitimu te marae, ko ngā te kahununu te iwi, ko tātai whakapapa anō, ko uh, te whakatōhia ngai tūhoi ngā te tarara anō hoki, ko te ana tōku ingoa. Um, let's go, let's start here. It's, it's a pretty difficult job um, going after the mana lineup of kai kōrero that we've had, and, and a lot of what I was going to say um, has actually been threaded in a lot of the kōrero that we've had. So what I will do is just um, briefly touch on some of the threads and then move towards a solutions orientation of, of how we move forward and, and, and where to go from here. Um, and, so, and so where I fit in is that I'm a young rangatahi Māori, 
um, born and bred in the East Coast um, and have, and have uh, moved in this space because of what's happening in, in my whenua back home. Um, and, and what we come to understand and what has been threaded into the co uh, conversations here is that climate change will always be the end result of the systems and structures that we live under. That is colonisation, capitalism and the overconsumption of goods that actually have no whakapapa to where we, to where we are now. Um, and, and, so, and so in moving forward into, into um, the next thread is, is kind of um, what does it look like now? So right now we have a massive severing of whakapapa. We have people disconnected from the places and, and people that they come from. We have all sorts of, as people have said, we have disorders, mental health, we have really unwell whenua, we have um, yeah, all of these things that, that I can probably tie into um, this. This is, this is my whenua, this is where I come from. And this is probably images that you guys are now desensitized to. But when I was at home, I was at home for the cyclones. Um, it was a pretty wild experience, to be honest, because I started my journey into Te Taiao at a young age because our tupapaku were falling into our awa because of the erosion, because of the sediment, because of the affluent from industries that actually don't care about us. And so here in these, in these images, on the top right is my uncle Kiwa, and then my cousins, and these images blew up all across the motu. On the bottom, we have, we have what was <clears throat> our city, and then on the right, we have our papa kainga. And in our papa kainga, flooded to the rooftops where my nan and my kōrō had to be tracted and then helicoptered out of our place, um, which is an absolute severing of whakapapa. Um, and I guess what that looks like now, and to put it into context, is quite often the solutions to climate change really focus on the biodiversity. And while 75% of New Zealand's biodiversity remains on the 1.3 million hectares of Māori land that's not in dock trusts, the solutions to climate change can't just be on the, the biodiversity of our whenua, but actually the whole systems and structures and the mindsets that we all have um, and that we contribute to. Um, yeah. I'll move on from... Move on from... That. And so in, <clears throat> in thinking about how we uh, move forward together, um, what we come back to is uh, the restoration of whakapapa. And that is, we all come from somewhere. We all come from people, we come from whānau, we come from places and community. And so how do we have good relationships and right relationships with each other? And that looks like, for in this room, majority of you are probably Pākehā, and that means the only place in Aotearoa, and the only place in the world that you can be Pākehā is in Aotearoa. And you should be really proud to be Pākehā. I myself carry Pākehā whakapapa, and that means that even though the atrocities of the past have and continue to manifest into the situations that we have today, that means that you have been given a tool and uh, relationality to tangata whenua through te tiriti. And when we look at te tiriti, underneath te tiriti is a tikanga framework of how to be in right relationship with each other. Because many of you work in the, in the health and, and medical fields, that looks like that looks like whakawhanaungatanga with the people that you meet. That looks like saying who you are, where you come from, even if you don't know where you come from, saying, I grew up here, is, is an opportunity for someone to make a hononga, a connection to you. And that one connection to you may be the, the tangible change that enables them to be properly seen in the fields that you work in, to be, to be heard, to have agency and restore their own modi and mana, and then, again, rebuild the restoration of whakapapa. Um, as Anna said earlier, um, we need to shift the way in which we fit into the world. And as has been threaded in, into the many corridor today, it's the understanding that ko ko te taiao, ko te taiao, ko au, ko tātou ko te taiao, ko ko te taiao, ko tato. Um, and that means that, that means that while we, we see ourselves as the environment, intrinsically part of the environment, the reality is that many of us live 
in lives where we're busy rushing from one thing to another, where we don't get to interact with the tile, where we don't get to interact with the systems and structures that we, that we usually do. So if we look at, as an example, food systems and structures. In Aotearoa, we don't have a food shortage, we have a food distribution problem. We produce enough food to feed 70 million people, yet we have many, many people, mostly tangata whenua and marginalised communities in this country going, going or starving because they don't have access to food. Yet, yet you know, we, we produce enough food. So for us that are, have the privilege of having roofs over our head, having having Kai in the fridge, it's about how can we become conscious of our decisions? How can we um, restore consciousness in, in the everyday reality? So instead of, as an example, being passive consumers of the agriculture and horticulture industries, actually being um, active participants within them, which means maybe spending a little bit more to make sure that you have the, like, that you are you know, supporting the local producers, making sure that you go to places where the soils are rich in nutrients, where you're contributing to the biodiversity, where you're contributing to the whakamana of te taia, where you're contributing to the whakamana of ngā tangata whenua o Aotearoa. Um, yeah, and yeah, I, I was going to um, share a quick poem that one of my dear friends wrote, um, and I was going to read this before, but I'll, I'll just read it now, and it kind of threads into the corridor that we had before in that um, talking about climate anxiety, um, which actually, when I was at home and when we had the cyclones, what we saw there and what wasn't shown on the news was a, a massive unity of mahitahi. It was like, we, we had no water, we had no power, it was our farmers from the rural communities bringing in on their tractors tanks of water for us that didn't have water. It was, it was all the people that um, perpetrated our gangs. They were there shoveling silt from my nans. Like, they were the ones that were actually there helping us. And, and that's, again, where we see a severing of whakapapa, is that what happens in big cities, what happens in big institutions, is that we forget the humanity. So we need to re-remember the humanity in all of these um, situations. So this is a poem written by um, a friend of mine called Abby Hodaki. <clears throat> and she writes, Tafidi Matia taught me that, the separa oh, that separation anxiety is normal, and if something is too painful to bear, then we can turn our grief into stars. When the land wasn't enough, they stole our fitu too, plucking hiwa itirangi and pahutakawa until our skies went dark, and we forget, and we have forgotten, and that's what brought us here. But like a language that was silenced, and a kuya who walked for acres, light still shines, whether we are looking or not, but we are looking now. And one of the things that, um, again, people forget, or, or maybe don't have uh, an understanding of, is that to be a good Pākehā, to be good tangata tiriti, is to be okay with being uncomfortable, is to be okay with making mistakes and being gently told, or maybe not in some cases, that it's a, it's a pivot into the right direction and how to be in relationship um, with people. And also, at the moment, there's an acute desire to be in relationship with Māori. But the thing is, we don't have capacity to be in relationship with every single person. And so, in organisations, big or small, it's about nurturing and um, looking after the Māori within those organisations to hold the relationship with iwi, with mana whenua, with Māori communities, so that, as an example, if you have a flatmate that like, takes their cup of tea, you're not going to ask them 17 times how they like their cup of tea, because you know that they like their cup of tea with one sugar or with one milk. So it means that the Māori within your organisation know the iwi enough to be like, okay, we know how they're potentially going to be on this issue at this certain time, because there's a whakapapa of understanding. And that whakapapa of understanding is sometimes intrinsically easier to be let out from a from a Māori to Māori um, relationality. And that also means that if, if we look after our, our Māori that are in the spaces that we operate, they're going to intrinsically look after you. We don't want to hold our culture to ourselves. We, you know, our ancestors, they signed Te Tiriti because they saw 
or not. They saw, um, <laughs> they saw the, the joy and the beauty of being in relationship and right relationship with each other. They wanted to share our, our culture, and that's because, not even just our culture, but the ways of being. Um, quite often, matauranga Māori is used predominantly in fields of biodiversity, but actually, if we look at matauranga Māori and uh, indigenous ways of being, it also tells us how to be in governance, how to rule, and that's because, again, we see a level, we see a level playing field, and we also look at generations beyond, beyond what's just in front of us. We look at the seven generations after us, and we look at how to make the world better for, for each of us now, which is something that we can't do under systems like capitalism, like, you know, all of the things. Um, yeah, I have seven minutes before the minister arrives, so I'm happy to have a conversation or take any part. I. Kia ora, Tiana. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I just wonder if it would be worthwhile just exploring a little bit in more detail that capacity tolerance um, that you talked about for Māori to hold relationships you know, with everybody, because it is an issue. Yeah. It's a huge issue. And so uh, what advice would you give um, to the well-meaning people who aren't Māori, who um, want, for all sorts of reasons sometimes, <laughs> that says a lot about their own whakapapa or loss of, perhaps, um, what advice would you give to them about how best to manage that? Mm -hmm. with alongside that pressure you feel? Yep. Uh, firstly, there, in, the, in the time and age that we live in, there's uh, so many resources out there about how to dig into your own whakapapa, how to look at pipiha. In my whanau and where we come from, we don't actually learn our pipiha until we understand the whakapapa of the whenua because, and what we see now is that people are learning Karakia, people are learning their pepeha to as rote memorizations, but not as in, as instruments of relationality. And we can tell that ingenuineness, and that ingenuineness is what translates when well-meaning pakeha come to us with really basic questions that they could otherwise look at and um, look up themselves. Yeah. In terms of like. Um, in terms of like adding to the burden of, of how to be in relationship with Māori, I think it's just trusting that even you again you just have to be okay with being uncomfortable and being being mis or sorry redirected should any of your facado be um, touchy. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of it's it's, it's a bit. Um, yesterday um, there were some interesting questions around coming from from the audience and from the hubs around um, what can Pākehā do to sort of support um, you, um, Māori, more generally, I think. Um, and there were some very clear answers. You, were, you heard those answers. And so, how, so, so just talk to us a little bit about that relationship in the sense of, it's, a, it's an expansion a bit on what we've been talking about, about, um, I suppose it's, I suppose, well, talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, and, but, but what we heard was that um, uh, what we, the best thing we can do is if we have the resources, give those resources to you and allow you to do what you need to do with those resources. Can you just talk to me a little bit more about that? Is that something, is, can you expand on that a bit yeah, more? Sure. Um, I'll give an example. It's, it's about giving resources, but it's about giving resources in the right way. So after the cyclones in Te Wairo and Te, Ra Te Tairawhiti, the Red Cross earned millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yet, we have yet to see a quarter of that go directly to community. So it's about giving directly to communities that have been affected. Um, it's also about, if in your systems and structures, if there are no Māori at your decision-making tables, make space for the decision-making at the decision-making tables. If there's only one Māori, one Māori cannot speak for all Māori, we need to support them by giving, giving, getting other Māori, and that is what te looks like. It looks more than partnership, it looks like building the relationality. Um, 
in terms of yeah, in terms of giving resources, that's definitely a thing, but it's also about restoring the right relationship because even if you, you don't have anything to give, but you give but you give an empathetic relationship, that that is sometimes enough. Um, yeah. Tiana, thank you very much um, for your cordial. It's been fabulous. Um, and um, hopefully uh, you'll hang around for a bit longer until we conclude. Um, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> welcome, Minister. So, Minister Hinare is, um, um, comes from a, has his own whakapapa, and a glorious one, actually, I have to say. Um, your father, Arima Hinare, was head of the Māori Language Commission. Your grandfather, Sir James Hinare, was a lieutenant colonel in the Māori Battalion. Monte Cassino? Yes, in fact, he took charge of the, of the battalion at the Battle of Cassino and was its final commander. My father fought there, actually, oh, with wow. the Polish army. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, he spoke of the Māori Battalion. Very cool. Yeah, it was cool. Um, and you're a member of Te Runanga o Te Tiriti o Waitangi, commander of the British Empire, Empire CBE. That was your, your, your grandfather and your mm. great-grandfather, Tua, tua Reka Reka, Tau Henare was also a member of parliament for the former electorate Northern Māori from not, 19... to be, not to be confused with the, the other Tau Henare that uh, jumped ship a bit, the water yes, jumping Tau right. Henare. Yeah, well, right. it's, it's the same great grandfather. Ah, it's, oh, okay, I didn't realise. Okay, oh, cool. Okay. Um, and so uh, you have been uh, a minister of, uh, uh, Associate Minister of Health and the Environment, you are, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Minister for Defence, I understand. Uh, quite a few portfolios. Yeah. But, yeah that's the job. Well, um, we're really pleased to have you here, Minister, you. and Thank I'll you. hand over to you. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, kia ora, David, and, and thank you very much for the introduction. It's, um, it's always quite humbling, and I caught the end of the last speaker, if she's still here, uh, talking about whakapapa, and when you speak to my whakapapa, it's always quite humbling. Uh, to be reminded of those deeds. In fact, I was with my kids in Parliament today, uh, catching up on quite a lot of work after a trip to China last week. And we were walking through the halls and they saw the photo of my great-grandfather uh, and my ratbag cousin, Tau Henare. Uh, and then they worked out amongst themselves, my babies, 10 and 11, that our family is the third longest serving family in Parliament. Uh, and when you put it that way, you sort of sit back and go, oh, wow. Yes, quite a, quite a few years of service there. Um, interestingly enough, they also discovered the first two are the Tirikatenes and then the Nashes. Uh, but nonetheless, here I am here today and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I always said that when I left university, I was never going to come back and give a lecture. And so I don't plan on doing that again today, but um, I've got a few speaking notes that I'll speak to, but what I would much rather towards the end of this opportunity is a chance to have something that's a little bit more interactive uh, and isn't just me standing at the front talking at you. So as is mentioned in my uh, introduction, uh, I am the Associate uh, Environment Minister and have been since the beginning of this year, but I've been the Associate Health Minister for five, just over five years now. And what was clear when uh, my uh, the former uh, Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, uh, allocated the portfolios, she always said to all of us who were lucky enough to be ministers in her cabinet, she said, these portfolios are by design. And I used to sit back and think, what does that mean? And so if I think across all the portfolios I've held in the six years in my time as a minister, um, you can see some common themes here. And if I look back in particular over the last three years, uh, I've, look, I've been the Minister for Fano Ora, now Associate Minister for the Environment, Associate Minister for Health, and Associate Minister for Housing. I'm now the Minister for the Forestry. And I sit back and I think to myself, there's got to be a connection here. What does well-being look like? How do we make sure that the silos that everyone in our community speaks to actually are things that are either imaginary 
or if they are actual barriers, how do we push them over? How do we make sure that an unwell family in a new home isn't still an unwell family? You can build all the homes you want, but you're still putting unwell families into new homes. Sure, it might be one part of the challenge. Sure, it one, might be one answer to the question. But there are bigger things at stake here. There are bigger things at play here. So the opportunity to come and speak to you all is something that I'm actually quite excited about because what it does is it brings a focus and a particular purpose about what we're trying to achieve here. I know you heard from my uh, esteemed colleague this morning, uh, James Shaw, a man who I have huge respect for, a man who is very, very clear about his purpose, his why, and of course the science of the care for the environment and climate change. Somebody I work closely with as the Minister for the Forestry and as the Associate Minister for the Environment, a man I have deep respect for. So hopefully I don't contradict everything he says. But nonetheless, we've got an opportunity here to look at what does this look like? And in particular with a focus on Te Ao Māori. And we only need to look to examples in the East Coast and in Te Tai Tokero and in Thames about the way we might be able to do things with a Te Ao Māori focus which not only looks towards making sure we have a strong climate future, but more importantly, well-being in that space and what it looks like. So can I acknowledge you all uh, for your participation? I've had a quick chat outside with the team, and I hear that it's been a very, very good time to come together. And to those online, um, like every Wellingtonian says, it's always beautiful weather here. Coming from the Bay of Islands, I can test that, but nonetheless, Climate change and health, what does this mean? We know that there are incre increasing health risks with climate change. We, I won't canvas too much of this, but adverse weather events, higher temperatures, all those matters are impacting on our health. The natural environment is clearly an important determinant of health, particularly for indigenous peoples. But I'm going to go even further and say for all of us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I've often wondered why, as I've opened medical centres around this country and a number of hospitals with Prime Ministers over the past six years, why they don't feel like places of well-being, why they feel like a concrete room. And I know there are some regulations that talk about fire risk and all these other things, but what I'm sitting, while I'm sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, it doesn't feel like a place of well-being. Yet, as the Minister for Tourism, I've had the good fortune of being on some of the greatest cycleways in this country. And as I've gone and I'm huffing and puffing on that bike, I've thought to myself, this feels like well-being. This feels pretty bloody good. Ignored my asthma. <laughs> Ignored how unfit I am. Ignored the fact that I probably need to lose a bit of weight. But I thought to myself, this feels like well-being. So, how do we bring these perspectives together? How do we make sure, too, that as we look towards climate change and health, we don't force more inequities into a system that has proven to already be inequitable to Māori in particular, but to other parts of our community as we look towards the health reform work? We must understand, though, that any work undertaken in environmental sustainability and climate resilience space must reinforce te tiriti or waitangi the obligations that our ancestors signed to, to make sure that we aren't just protecting the interests of Māori, but that we are protecting the interests of all. What was interesting in the piece around whakapapa is our whakapapa to the natural environment. And that's really important, as I'll, you'll find out a little bit later when I get into my kōrero. I'm always, I always have a little laugh with the linguists in this room. Uh, I'm a native Māori speaker, and I'm quite passionate about te reo Māori. And for those who engage in the Te Reo Māori debate, you'll hear of the A and O principles. And that's about what's superior and what's inferior and all this sort of stuff. And somebody said to me, here is a pencil, and the category will be A, which means you are superior to the pencil. And I said, well, Taiwa, wait a minute. In Māori whakapapa, the pencil comes from the rako, and the rako whakapapa through tāne, says that actually I'm its junior. Therefore, the category should be an O category. Well, this upset the entire curriculum. But what it does is it speaks to the depth of knowledge in Te Ao Māori, 
with respect to the way that we engage with our environment and what we, the decisions we need to make for well-being perspective. And that's what's really important. So this lens uh, is more than just about the commodity of an individual ownership and trade. It's got to be something deeper, like whakapapa. It's got to continue to have a sense of what it means to belong, whether you are Māori or Pākehā. And we have a responsibility, of course, to maintain the health of the environment, for the health of the environment will reflect the health of our people. Central to the belief is, of course, the intergenerational nature of the way we hand taonga down. If we think of well-being as a taonga, we must ask ourselves in this room and in this conference, how are we handing well-being down? What does that mean? Does it mean we hand te reo down for cultural well-being? Is it about teaching good practices to make sure our young people are fit and healthy? Is it about making sure that we respect and we protect our natural environment in order for all of our future generations to succeed? But I must come back to the point. As we enable action in climate resilience and environmental sustainability, we must always make sure that it is undertaken in an equitable way and doesn't exacerbate the health inequities already faced by so many parts of our community. So my colleague this morning would have spoken to you about carbon neutral government program. There's lots of things going on, but I want to specifically speak to Te Whatu Water and uh, Te Manatu Hauwara, who are working to ensure that we understand the impact of publicly funded healthcare provision on our national greenhouse gas emissions footprint. Now, if you were to walk into the streets of Kaitai and you bumped into Matua Hohepa and you talked to, talk to him about the provisions uh, uh, of healthcare and its impact on the national greenhouse gas emission footprint, he'll sort of look at you and go, hmm? What we're saying here is how do we, in new health reform, not only change the system, but actually change the environment in which we deliver health, the environment in which we practice our healthcare, and the environment in which we make sure that healthcare is accessible. Now we can do a number of things here. We can do what many of the big corporate agents do and they change their fleet out to an electric vehicle. Awesome, kawai. But what does this mean when you live in Waitaki, an hour and a half from the nearest hospital, an hour from the nearest doctor, on roads that are probably made for horses, but we've transformed them over the years into a place where we can drive cars. What does this mean? It means, for example, my colleague Calvin Davis in Te Tai Tokero, during the floods who has an EV doing the right thing, it means he can't get to the communities that he's there to serve. The EV can't go to these places. It can't go into flooded waters. It can't go into communities that have been isolated because of flood waters. So we've got to be very pragmatic in the way we look towards making sure that we can manage our national greenhouse gas emission footprint. And that is the job of some very, very clever and talented people at Te Whatu Ora and Te Manatu Hauora, and with the support of Te Aka Whai Ora, the Māori health uh, uh, provider, the Māori health agency. So we've got to understand what the health impacts of climate change are to ensure we're able to embed the knowledge and strategy into planning across the sector and to take this co-designed approach. Now, I know a few people in this room who have been around the bureaucracy will go, oh, there's that co-design word again. What does that mean? And, oh, we've had a lot of co-design in the past. We've had co-investment. We've had co, what's the new one? Co-governance, which isn't that new, but nonetheless, we've got all the co's. What I've actually discovered in my time as an MP, and that's a decade now, that the biggest co is unco. That's uncoordinated for those in the room. That means that despite our best efforts and despite all of the planning work that we do across agencies, often it's still a lot, it's still clunkier than we want it to be. It doesn't quite hit the mark as much as we need it to. It means that some are slightly ahead of the others. And we need to make sure in the opportunity we're given in health reform to change our health system into te aka whai ora, whatu ora, and te manatu hau ora, we've got an opportunity to do this and do it all together. So there have been a number of initiatives that might support that. There's been close to $100 million in energy transition program. Those are all simple ones that are easy to see and easy to understand. 
When you talk to Matua Hohepa in Kaitaia, you can say, Matua, we're changing out the coal boilers in your hospital. That's an easy one. That's a good one. That's something Matua Hohepa can understand. We need to change our estate. We need to make sure that our communities see what that means. See what that means. It's no good providing them the strategy of how we're looking to reduce carbon emissions when they can't see tangible ways of what that means. Removing coal boilers in hospitals is an easy one. Electric vehicles, another. But we need to do so much more. So we've got a commitment here to building a health system that's different. One that New Zealanders understand, and also one that's responsible for its part to play in climate change. Acknowledging that the determinants of health must be considered in this planning. The health reforms, as I've said, have provided us with that opportunity. So we ask ourselves then, what now? Te Aka Whaiora and Te Whatu Ora have just had their first birthday. Happy birthday. We come again into a period of matariki, and it allows us to look, reflect back on the one year that's gone, but more importantly, look towards the future. What we need is stakeholders from across all parts of the health system driving conversations about how we can do things differently, listening and incorporating the needs of Fano and communities. As the Associate Housing Minister, we secured a billion dollars to build a Māori housing pipeline. It might surprise you that when we worked with iwi and we worked with community organisations, not one person talked about building a Māori health clinic in the communities that we were aiming to build. It might surprise you to hear that Māori health providers at the outset weren't included in the discussions that we have about building communities. Coming back to the point I said earlier, an unwell family in a new home is still an unwell family. And we must continue to ensure that there is connectivity across our system so that we don't have the tensions between our service delivery organisations, the people we're trying to serve, and of course our obligations to our environment. Under old systems, what we saw was too much inconsistency, which is why we set out on a once-in-a-generation change to the health system. The disconnected system continued to impede on the way that we deliver solutions, regardless of whether or not they're health or better environmental sustainability. My hope is that with the first birthday of our new health system, we can continue to make sure that we nurture this tamaiti or this child to be the child we need it to be into the future. This is the opportunity that we have today. A national approach can be taken to determine access to waste minimization, circular economy uh, opportunities, prioritizing sustainable infrastructure investments. We can do that. But what we need to do while taking a national approach is continue to remember what this means in the region. What does this mean in a small place called Waimahana, where I grew up? What does this mean in Mount Wellington, in Tamaki Makoto, where I now live? It means that we've got to take the opportunity to share and engage with bigger stakeholders, representatives of a system of well-being and not simply a system of health. That system of well-being must continue to speak to the climate obligations that we have, it must speak to the environmental aspirations that we have, and it must continue to bring the entire community on that journey. But it must do it with mana. It must do it with purpose and direction. And what do I mean by that? For far too long as we've gone into communities to engage with them about their cultural environment, their natural environment, and their health environment, We've taken all their ideas, brought them down here to Wellington, and made sausages. And what we've done is we've cooked those sausages up and taken them back into those regions. They didn't ask for sausages. They asked for something that was far better connected, something that was far more engaged, and something that was far more deliberate. The biggest thing we must do in this journey is to bring the community on that journey. Otherwise, this will be another great action plan that's written and sits on the shelf of a minister's office here in Wellington. So, in taking a holistic and whānau-centred approach to a framework alongside continued work in climate 
climate mitigation and adaption, we've got an opportunity to be bold and to ensure that the environmental sustainability and climate resilience is at the centre of our decision making moving forward. I'm energised by those discussions as we have seen the impacts of the recent weather events and the desire now for communities to look towards far more sustainable outcomes, far more sustainable well-being, and we as a government look towards climate adaptation, we must bring all of these factors together in the way we plan our communities and our well-being into the future. Not for the individual alone, but certainly for the family, certainly for the wider community. Take my small township of Kaio in the far north, which regularly is flooded. Why would we continue to build more into that community that gets flooded? Let's work with that community who wish to change where they are, who wish to change their environment, and who wish to change their well-being outcomes. That is the opportunity that we are presented with here today. So, I said I didn't come along to do a lecture today, but more importantly, to have something a little bit more engaging. I don't profess to have all of the answers, but I'm sure amongst all of us here, we might come up with some pretty good opportunities, matters for discussion, and perhaps even some solutions that I can take back to my colleagues down in this round building down at the bottom of the hill. Dave, thank you everyone for the opportunity, and I look forward to some questions. Um, kia ora, uh, Minister Henare. Uh, there are some questions, and um, I want to just um, r remind um, you of a visit you made to Hapai yes, a while back, actually, yeah. uh, as a, I think as a, to visit the, um, the, the crew there and the Health Coalition Aotearoa, um, which is an organisation that is a uh, public health organisation largely uh, that presents evidence-based policy to reduce preventable harm from alcohol, tobacco and unhealthy food in particular, and also has a view on the public health infrastructure. And we talked a lot. I remember you saying, um, you know, uh, we, we, you saying that you're not that keen on you know, cutting the ribbons on dialysis units. Mm. You know, uh, really we've got to embrace the prevention uh, aspect pretty strongly, and the question relates to that, and I think, um, and, 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 and I think it questions about the government's resolve. And we know that politics are difficult here, you know, uh, but it relates to the government's resolve to really address those commercial determinants of, of health that, are, that account for so much of uh, a, a person, a Fano, a community's uh, well-being, and and. and I know how difficult that is um, in the politics of today, but um, the question relates to that and what can we do to help you? Yeah. Look, that's a great question and uh, there are, look, as far as I'm concerned, there, um, there's more than enough evidence to suggest or to at least point us to the, f to the fact that we need to change the way we look towards things such as alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, and matters such as uh, one that I know is a contentious one, that continues to um, be on the doorsteps of every politician, and that is a sugar tax. All of those matters are important ones that, look, uh, the research is there. You raised the point about the political will to be able to do this. And I'm up for continuing to push the fact that we need to take these things far more seriously. Now, whether or not we look towards hitting a home run or we build incremental steps, um, you know, I for one thought that uh, my colleague um, Chloe Swarbrick's view to removing advertising, uh, you know, alcohol advertising in sports is one of those no-brainers. For one of those children who grew up in the uh, 90s and 80s, you know, we used to all watch the Winfield Cup. Yeah. Can, can you imagine? That? <laughs> Today, no, no, no one really understands what that means, but back in the day that was just normal. And so we've shown that we can change these things and we can do that. I'd probably buy more Warriors jersey and they, and they might have more luck if they took the alcohol sponsorship off. I don't know. Yeah. But they need all the luck that they can bloody get at the moment. Yeah. But the point is, um, look, it's clear and it's clear to me in particular from in my role as a, a, a minister with the drive for Māori health that we have to do some drastic things here. And those are predominantly legislative things. Yeah. Um, yeah. The system is doing great stuff. I've seen amazing, and through Harpai, yeah. through the communities, through public health, already amazing things that change.
the health and the environment of our people, um, legislation is that whole other beast that I'm prepared to tackle, just like I know a number of my colleagues are, but not all of us are. Yeah, thank you, Minister. It is, it is of course, a, a really effective route, but of course it, it's the most, it carries the most political risk, and I think we all understand that. So I think that um, we all have a role in supporting the Minister in that aspiration. So I think that let's do that uh, in, in our own ways and do that collectively. Um, another question, Minister, relates to, um, I'll read it out. Kia ora, Minister. What more can our reforming health system, Aotearoa, do to help accelerate a transition away from our world-leading level of car dependency? Mm. And I know that's from um, Alex. Bike, 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 New Zealand, bike, cycling action. Cycling yeah. action. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I saw the smile on your face when I said I was on uh, one of the uh, cycleways. <laughs> Look, uh, I've just returned from China last week and the Chinese government have made it clear that they want China moving by 2035, which means everything they do is focused on getting them healthy and active, acknowledging that if you do that, you remove the costs down the line for healthcare. So there are opportunities for us here to do it. And you know, sadly, as I've traveled around the country as tourism minister, one of the lines that has been used with me on a couple of occasions is, when you grow up in New Zealand, you've got two things in your blood. Blood and petrol. Seriously, that, that's, those are the lines that are, uh, that are discussed with me. And I'm thinking, huh, geez, that's a really hard thing to break, is that dependency on, on, on cars, on petrol cars and diesel cars. But I think we can take note uh, about what they've done in China and just make it a very clear target. I think there's been some great innovation and solutions discussed once we've set different targets for carbon reduction, carbon emission reduction, amongst other things. Take uh, the Queenstown Airport, for example. Their goal is to be carbon zero by 2030. And in fact, from everything that I can see, they're already on track to do that. You take the Christchurch Airport, believe it or not, they're actually uh, in carbon positive, uh, well, which is a reverse term, saying that actually they've done so well, they're doing better than carbon zero, they're actually putting better stuff back into the community. So when you set a target like that, I think it starts the innovation and starts the pressure to make sure we hold all of our feet to the fire on the matter. And I think that's what we should be doing to shift people from cars onto public transport or whatever it might be. Living in Auckland, Tell you what, everyone I've spoken to say they'll catch more public transport if it was more reliable. Yeah, you bet. You know? So let's, I mean, those are things we can actually fix. You don't need legislation to fix that. You just need a far more reliable service than those who deliver it yeah, in Auckland. And, and a mayor who gets it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that'd be good. Yeah. So look, I, I haven't lost hope here. I, I've actually, I actually think that when you draw a line in, in, you know, into the future, everyone puts all their their brain power and their willpower to doing our best to get there. We just need, in particular in cities, because it's so run so differently around the country, you know, communities who are prepared to stand up and do that. Auckland, it's a case in point, with the current mayor and the council, that's going to be difficult. That's just a, a sad reality. But when I met with the um, Queenstown mayor, um, uh, Glenn Lewis, the new Queenstown mayor, he's quite clear, if the airport can do it, we all can do it, and we can make Queenstown a zero carbon emitter. Can you imagine that? It's hard to believe. And it was, I was down there a few months ago, and it's still hard to believe, but they've set the target, the airport's doing it, and I think the community's gonna get there too. Kia ora, Minister. We're very grateful for you uh, for coming today. Um, you know, Oh, we've got more? Yeah, yeah, keep going. Oh, good, okay. Oh, there's more questions coming, oh, good. Okay, listen, all right, here's one. Um, oh, it's from Debbie, it, she says, if there was one thing that we could do to respond to the threat of climate change, or what's the, or put it this way, what is our greatest opportunity to respond to the threat of climate change to keep us all safe? What do you think? I, I firmly believe it's Matauranga Māori. Yeah, good. And I use the example for those of you who are, oh yeah, it's a few of us in the room, uh, you'll recall the Matata flood uh, that flooded the beautiful township of Matata. Yeah. There's a reason why the marae is on the hill. And that marae is over 100 years old. Yeah. That marae was built there because they've known it to flood down on the, on the beach, down on the waterfront. So they built the marae up there. 
It's the same again in the small community where I come from, a place called Motato. It's the same thing. We shifted our marae 115 years ago because we saw what was happening around us. So there's a real uh, opportunity here to look towards Mato Ranga Māori uh, to make sure that we can protect ourselves into the future. For anyone who knows the far north well, you'll know that at some point in time in our history, a massive tidal wave has washed over the top of the North Island. Because you'll see all the swamp kodi lies the same way. Yeah? That's Mato Ranga. Mm. And my ancestors, who in particular the gum diggers from uh, the early settled, colonial settlements in the north have written huge amounts of, of, of research about what does this mean? Yeah. What did it do to the environment? How did it change the marshes and, and, and the, uh, you know, the landscape in Taitukero? All that stuff is there. Yeah. And, and I think we've got a grand opportunity to look towards how Mātauranga Māori can help us yeah. adapt in the first instance and then secondly, bring more resilience to what we do. Well, I, I've got to say, after two fantastic days here, my God, is that the right answer? Mm. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you said that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a really good answer. So, and actually, we've heard some, um, f some fabulous corridors from, from speakers um, talking about that very issue around, particularly some questions were uh, directed to, uh, it was actually um, it was Dan Hikuroa, oh. um, you know, uh, asking about you know, the, the, the opportunity for Mātauranga Māori to keep up the, for places where we could go, where we might be safe, but he turned it around in exactly the same way that you said and said, well, we certainly know from history where, th where, where the risk is. Mm. And so he turned that around and said, it, a, a, enormous value in exactly the same way that you have. So look, Minister, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, it means a lot to us. Um, you know, your presence and your work and, um, is hugely important. Um, Anything that we can do to support you uh, in, in, the, in the conversations around prevention, um, around um, uh, spreading the word. I mean, for us to support the, the, the incorporation of Matoranga Māori into uh, you know, more, more widespread in, in government decision making. We've heard very strong messages from Māori during the, the, the last two days that the best thing we can do to support them is to actually give them the resources to look after themselves mm -hmm. and, to, and to do the things that they know that they need to do. And I think that's a, a similar sort of message in the health reform in a funny sort of a way because the health reform is really about you know, um, assisting those people closest to where care is being delivered to be successful. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's actually sort of a devolved decision making and devolving resources to those people to make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the model is a really good one and we're very grateful to you. No, thank you all for the opportunity thank to you, spend Minister. some time. Um, uh, I never like just having a good meeting and then calling it quits. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussions and the work that will come from this particular gathering. Uh, so if there's an opportunity to perhaps catch up Sure. Uh, in the next three to four weeks to cover yeah. off some of the good things That'd here that we can look towards yeah. our work program. Yeah. I, welcome I, I think it might be quite good for the group um, to synthesise some of the messages and the, 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 what we've heard here yeah, today and, and to actually sort of perhaps present that to you. Perfect. Um, and, you know, some of the, I mean, just for example, you know, I'm going to talk about the, one of the sessions we just had about food systems, you mm. know, um, sensational work being done here you know there's no shortage of you know of examples of things that if we were to sort of give them some resources and give them a bit of scale you know yeah yeah who knows what <laughs> excellent okay thank Minister. you thank you very much Dave. thank you thank, you. thank you thank you very much Well, um, we've come to close to the end. Toa, welcome. Thank you. Um, close to the end. And um, the organisers have said, can I summarise a, a few things? It's pretty hard to do, actually, to tell you the truth. You know, it's been an extraordinary couple of days for me. You know, I, I think I've um, learnt an enormous amount, but possibly at a bit of a superficial level. I've got a hint of what's, what's here, you know, the depth of knowledge um, and what the potential actually is, that Māori oho to Māori ora. Uh, so we're in that transition phase, aren't we? Um, and I think it's really making that step. And one of the 
best steps that we could possibly make is to follow the advice that we've heard from so many of our speakers, is to embrace this, to allow, the, allow Māori to uh, get ahead, to help us solve these problems through the knowledge systems that they have, um, they have and, uh, and, uh, and their, uh, the knowledge that they have gained over hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, some of the messages that I'm going to quickly summarise, and I'll be quite quick, um, uh, that actually I think we're blessed in this country. We don't know how blessed we are, um, but there's a lot to learn for many. You know, we are not um, the ecosystem, we are just a, a part of it. Um, we talked a bit about, uh, we talked a lot about whakapapa to place and to people. And we all have our places and we all have our people. And we talked a lot about allyship and um, how difficult this conversation can be and, you know, this business of anxiety that many of us feel and particularly our, uh, our kids feel about the future um, and how we deal with that and how we might do that together, uh, to talk about that together. To have those, um, and for us, one of the best things that possibly we can do leaving here is to go and have those conversations with those around us about what we've heard. Um, you know, and uh, was it India or was it Summer who said, um, have the conversation with your racist uncle, you know? <laughs> I think it was India actually, wasn't it? India, India yeah, they said that. So um, there's a lot for us to learn here. Um, enable the success of others, you know, let go, you know? It's not ours, it's theirs, let go. Enable the success of others for local communities, for Māori. Give them the resources they need to solve their problems. We heard it today, be a good ancestor. You know? how, how, think about how we're handing down well-being. You know? Recognise the sort of um, the colonial and capitalist structures and find our way around those things. You know? Actually, let's embrace the accountants. Let's, you know, let's, Let's talk to the accountants about how we value the things that need to be valued. You know, honest to God, you know, why can't they do that? You know, I think it's just lazy and unsophisticated, to tell you the truth. You know, and I think that there's a, there's a real challenge to them there. But I'm, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to just thank people. Um, I'm going to thank the sponsors uh, for this fabulous two days. Um, I'm not going to try and name them because I'll probably forget them, but I, I, well, maybe I should. I'll, I'll thank... Um, uh, the Fisher and Paykel Healthcare Foundation, nearly. I'll thank the ASMS. Um, I think uh, Sylvia's here on their behalf now. Uh, thank MAS, Medical Assurance Society. Uh, thank the University of Otago. Um, I'll thank Te Whata Ora. And uh, uh, Manatu uh, Hauora, the Ministry of Health. So I, I thank them all for their support for this forum. Um, the fifth one, there'll be another one next year, I'm certain. Um, I want to thank um, the conference organizers and the committee. You know, what a fantastic program. Honestly, it's just been a stunner. You know, you should be really proud of yourselves. And I want to thank the speakers, um, and the speakers are uh, stellar, you know. And, you know, uh, and thanks for giving up your time. And, um, you know, uh, and um, I know that having a relationship with us, Tiana, thank you for this, okay? Terrific, thank you, all right? Um, and I want to thank all the um, participants here in the hubs and the people who have supported those people in the hubs and the tech people that have made things work. It's been fantastic. Thanks, guys, up there and the people in the hubs. It's been really good. And all the Zoom attendees, there's a lot of them, you know, um, and um, they're sort of hiding behind their things now. But maybe just for the end piece now, you could flick your cameras back on and wave. That would be a nice thing to do. Peter Burton, come on. There, there he is. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's nice. Okay, cool. Um, and um, uh, a couple more things. Um, could you return your name badges? And I'm going to say one last thing. I'm going to thank Tor for his warm welcome and his protection while we've been here. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to thank you in advance of you closing us off. Uh, kia ora tātou, kia ora koutou, uh, ki te epurangi. Uh, he, he kupu whaka, whaka mutunga uh, mō tēnei taha o te, o te haukainga. Um, <clears throat> I've been a part of Mātauranga Māori most of my life, if not all of my life. My mother is an astronomer. Um, 
uh, my work in uh, celestial navigation and um, Matariki and the revival of our Matauranga Māori uh, came across many obstacles in its um, iteration as many of our ancestors had to try and promote our knowledge and to find it a, a safe place in our mainstream. Um, and just taking something from one of the first speakers uh, yesterday from India, uh, she had up here Tino Ranga Tiratanga on the screen. And I think it's important to remember that Matauranga Māori in the mainstream is about the self-determination, uh, that ability to be returned. Um, the knowledge is useful, the knowledge is uh, sound. Um, in the years past in my experience with astronomy, I was reading letters from the chief astronomer of the Dominion Observatory, whom he decided that he would just put away and hide. And then by the chief astronomer of 2008, 2009, the chief astronomer of that year was wanting to throw those out into the bin. And that's what riled me to establish the Society for Māori Astronomy Research and Traditions because some people just did not appreciate what was in front of them. Probably because they didn't understand its depth and its value and its context. So Matauranga Māori has great context in the modern era. Um, it's one of those age-old sayings of, in order to know where you're heading, you need to look back and see the wake that your waka has left behind. Um, we started this um, uh, hui, this wānanga, this taumata wānanga, uh, with a karakia that was about making landfall. And it was hearkening back to the era and time where our ancestors placed their knowledge, their life, in the hands of their matauranga that brought them to Aotearoa. And the karakia that I did in openings that was purely about making landfall. When we talk about kaupapa, kaupapa is kau kite papa, to make landfall, to arrive at your cause. And that requires a stout mind and heart that is infallible. If we decide we are going to embrace matauranga Māori, then we must do so wholeheartedly and move forward with it. Um, I'm partly preaching to the converted, because many of you have been doing that for most of your lives. But I'm just wanting to reiterate, for all of our ministers, and we have some great ministers that are, are really enthusiastic, they need our energy. They need our support. They need our kaha, because they're at the coalface, ki te muru te ahi, burning their fingers when the extreme right views come forth and say it's irrelevant, um, we don't need it. But if we think about the inequity and disparity of health, education, housing across Aotearoa, when has it ever been well? Well, if the system is not uh, recognising that and is in denial of its past, then uh, of course we'll never change the system. It needs a different system by which we come to the answers, and that is with the collectives of Fano, hapu, iwi, communities, Māori and Pākehā. But inside Mātauranga Māori was always a place for everyone. Inside Western uh, knowledge constructs in a colonial system was not always a place for Māori. So I just wanted to leave you with that. That's the wedo that you all have. You know the wedo. Um, but e hara taku tō i te tō takitahi, e ngāri he tō takitini. Our strength is not divided as one, but united as many. And if we are all uh, continuous in the way in which we keep together and move together and share that knowledge system, but also share the, the win, you know, rangahau in the community must be able to have um, gains that our Fano, hapu and iwi can see almost immediately. Not something that gives up to the greater ether of the good, but something that actually is um, physicalised in the process of doing rangahau with our people. So, 
those are the things that we look to to see that when we work with our people, we are lifting them, but we're also, by the way in which we are working with them, is going to be lifting them. So it is the kawa, it is the way in which we engage. So it's not always just the destination, it's that journey of that walker on the way. So, koe nga oku nei iti kōrero, ki te mihi mahana tēnei, ki te mihi nui, ki te minita mō tēnei ahiahi, mō tāna pūkenga, mō tāna tautoko ki tēnei huihuinga. Nō reira, ki oku to katoa, ka tukuna te karekia hei whakamutu, ka whakamutu mā te himene whakaaria mai. Pia. Kia ora. Kia ora. Unuhia, 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 turu tapu nui a tāne, kia wāte, kia māma, te ngākau, te hiningaro, te tīnana, te wairua ki te ara takatū. E rungo kua wāte, ai e rungo kua wāte. E rungo wakiri ake, ki runga, kia tīna, tīna. Hau mi e hui e tāiki e. Whakaari e mai, tātou. Whakaria mai, tori peka ki au, tia ho mai, raro to i te po, hei kona au. Titi roa tu ai Ora ma te Hei au koe noho ai Whakaria mai Tori peka ki au Tia ho mai, raro to i te po, hei ko nga au, titi rua tu ai, o rama te, hei au, Koe noho ai A mine Kia tau, kia tātou kato Te atawai o tō tātou ari ki a ihu karaiti Mi te aroha ki te atua Mi te whifunga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu Ake, 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 a mine Mauri ora whānau Kia ora, ko tahi a Kata Kata